thank you, everybody, for coming to, uh, to Williston's Development Review Board, um, March 26, 2019. It is the once a year growth management um, where we uh, uh, determine the uh, coming year's allocation of units to be built uh, or at least approved in, uh, in Williston. Um, uh, before we get started, um, anybody have any anything they'd like to present to the board uh, in advance of the meeting? So there certainly will be uh, um, there certainly will be uh, time for public comment after uh, um, each of the presentations of the uh, uh, growth management um, applications. Uh, so if you have something else you know, specifically you want to add to those. Uh, you will be able to do so at that time. Um, uh, we're going to start off with the uh, overview by the staff. And uh, Matt, I assume that's you. That'll be me. Great. Um, so as uh, Scott uh, Riley, our chair, mentioned, this is the annual growth management hearing of the Development Review Board in Williston. This happens once a year. Growth management in Williston is a required component of the residential subdivision and residential development review process. So um, projects that go through pre-application during a given calendar year are eligible to return for growth management allocation review once a year in the following March, which is where we are tonight. Um, Williston limits the number of new dwelling units that can be created through the subdivision process uh, per year and also geographically distributes those units with 56 units a year available in the town's growth center, 12 available in the other sewer service area, so the village and the residential zone around it, and 12 per year in the portion of town that is not served by sewer, essentially the ag rural zoning district. So the process for the board tonight is to hear this overview and then the staff will review briefly each of the projects and the draft score prepared by the staff growth management is a competitive process so there's scoring and there's prioritization and then there's an award of allocation the drb can consider <coughs> at the end of the process so a couple of things about growth management that are uh, changing and or are different this year from years past. The select board did recently approve some changes to growth management. Many of those changes are related to the review criteria and the scoring criteria. And none of those changes are actually effective tonight. So the scoring criteria for all of the projects that went through pre-application in calendar 2018 are the same as they were when that growth management chapter existed in calendar 2018. New projects that come in for pre-application during calendar 2019 will be subject to a slightly different set of criteria um, that are part of that new bylaw. There are some changes to growth management that affect any project that either uh, got or will get allocation uh, in Williston, and those changes are effective now. Most recent amendments involve timing of unit construction and expiration of allocation. So I'll do those in, in order. Um, under timing, you know, Growth management allocation, a dwelling unit is assigned a, a year, a fiscal year, in, and it can't be built before that fiscal year. And projects with multiple units often are assigned units going out across multiple fiscal years out into the future. Under the amended provisions of growth management, units are still assigned a given year like that. But projects as a whole simply get a minimum start date related to their earliest allocation. And once a project begins to build, it can build units from any of the years it has received allocation in, in order until the project is complete. Um, this was a change adopted by the select board. It essentially allows projects to begin sooner after their approval because there's more units available to build right away. And it's likely that um, following the orderly construction of a project, there will be a lull where that project might have some units that were available in future years, but they've already been built and the project is done. 
So uh, timing is more flexible than it used to be under the old rules. The other major change that subject um, that old projects, projects tonight, projects in the future will be subject to is related to expiration. So over the years, um, allocation has had an expiration date varying from three to five years from its start date, where if you got allocation and you didn't build a house, eventually your right to build a house on that created lot simply went away. Um, that can create some really untenable scenarios like lots being platted that no longer have a right to be developed, et cetera. That has been replaced in revised growth management with what we call the slow build provision. Um, so depending on the size of your project, if you go out of that five-year window for your allocation, you can continue to build units, but at a slower pace than you might have been able to originally. And, and so for... Um, Small projects, a, a, a one, two, or three unit project, you get to build one a year. Um, for larger projects, you get to build a few more a year, but it's intentionally designed that if you had a very large project and you know, did not start using your allocation in the five year window, the slow build would be so incredibly slow um, that an applicant would be far more likely to come back and reapply under the current bylaw and ask for new allocation. So. Timing of unit construction is a little different. <coughs> Build schedules um, and expiration are a little bit different. Um, those are things that will apply to things, to projects that receive allocation tonight, but they're not really part of what gets discussed tonight, which is the scoring and the draft allocation schedule prepared by the staff. There's one other change that does have some impact to the way the staff is recommending that allocation be awarded this year. And it has to do with projects in the agricultural rural residential zoning district where for certain large parcels the town has an open space requirement which for many years the town has had a requirement that if you're subdividing more than 10 and a half acres um, in the ag rural district 75 percent of that acreage is required to be set aside as permanently protected open space at a minimum by designation on the approved final plan uh, that's been the case for at least 10 years in Williston now. In May of 2018, the Select Board adopted a change to that rule. The 75% rule is still in effect, but that open space, which could prior, previously be designated sort of, you know, cross-hatched out or shaded as part of, you know, some portion of a large remainder lot in the subdivision, that open space now is required to be platted as a separate parcel. So you can imagine that if you're somebody subdividing a large parcel of land, you might have um, some lots you want to create that you want to build on. And you might have your lot that you're being required to create to provide the 75% open space. And you also might have some leftovers. You might have some land that you don't really um, want to develop today. You're not asking to develop it under um, whatever applications you make following growth management but you don't want to give up more than 75% of the land. So you, you have the requirement to plat open space results in a need for applicants to plat lots that are not currently planned for development, um, but that nevertheless are separate from the other lots in the project. So staff has identified uh, two projects like that in rural Williston that are under consideration tonight where applicants have proposed a certain number of lots for development, have proposed an open space lot, and have some leftover land. And what staff is proposing the DRB do is treat those projects as if those lots will eventually be developed, um, assign them allocation, understanding that discretionary permit, which is the next stage after this stage of review, can come in for a phase one where the applicant develops what they wanted to develop all along. The remainder lots are left for further review under a different um, discretionary process. So it's, um, it's a wrinkle created by something that's part of the ag rural zoning district now. Um, it means that sometimes applicants or their projects look like they're looking for more units than they might have suggested they were asking for it pre-application that's that's by design and we had a big conversation in, internally with the staff about well, what do we do with these remainder lots we could just score the project as if we didn't think they were ever going to be developed um, but we know they probably will be 
and there are things about the way projects in ag rural are scored that can be impacted by whether those lots are developed so such as the the, the relative visibility of the units that might be created in the future it makes more sense to the staff to review the projects as if those lots will be eventually developed score them that way and that way if they do come in for development we're not concerning ourselves with whether that future development undermines the growth management scores that get assigned tonight. I'll, I'll stop there for a second to um, answer any clarifying questions. Because everybody's think. confused enough without having to go forward. It's a big change. Yeah. Okay. What if, what if a, oh, from us? Yeah, yeah. anybody. Yeah. Well, what, if, what if somebody truly intends not to ever develop? They, they want to either convey development rights or they just have really no intention of it. Future if, development. If there's they just want open space. If somebody wants to just have the open space, they can make they can make that land part of their open space lot. So you know, seventy five percent. But they could also minimum. just sit on that other lot. They, Correct. They it's can. not open space. It hasn't designated as open space. Mm -hmm. Seventy five percent of the anything greater than ten and a half acres would be developed. But, but they could have another lot. Yep. which is not planned for development and they maybe it's going to be given to their kids or maybe yep. it's going to be passed on pace passed on correct i mean correct. It, it does not have to be developed nope there's so you know we've we've had lots of precedent in williston where um discretionary permits that followed from a pre-application and growth management uh decision were broken into phases so you know essentially what what the drb saw in these two projects could be thought of as um, a pre-application for a phase one a growth management allocation schedule that covers phase one and what might someday be phase two but then the project can go forward with that phase one discretionary permit and all it means is if we need to come back and re-review development on you know i've got this lot i don't want to develop it today someday i might give it to my kids the development of that lot would return to the DRB for discretionary permit review at the time that that kind of development was desired. So the, the, the goal here from the staff's perspective is to handle all of the growth management allocation so we're not creating lots that are effectively without that right to develop um, that comes from growth management and also making sure that the totality of development that might happen on the parent parcel is reviewed as part of the scoring tonight. So you, you don't want someone to come back to develop one of those remainder someday I'll develop it lots and then their plan is to do something that means you wouldn't have scored the project the way you scored it tonight. Because essentially the horse is out of the barn on that score after uh, this evening. So we thought it better as a staff to recommend the DRB anticipate future development even if it might be in, a, in some subsequent phase of review some time off in the future. This is a complicated issue to ask, to go over tonight. Um, so the original 10 or 75 percent open space is based on the original, or I should say the amount that's set aside as open space is 75 percent of the original parcel. Yes. So therefore the potentially developed areas will have had a corresponding amount of open space already set aside. Correct. They're, so it's not developing that won't require additional. It, it would open not. Space. Um, in, in the case of the ones you'll see tonight, those remainder lots are smaller than ten and a half acres anyhow. So would not. Well, exactly. But I would hate subject. to avoid. Uh, we need. I think you need to make sure that the, the seventy-five percent is of, of the entire parcel. Yes. But, but I think that you could take that one step further and just kind of talk this out just so people in the audience kind of hear this another scenario would be if somebody shows up with a with a hundred acre parcel and uh, wish to develop it and then the open space would be 75 acres leaving 25 acres to be developed uh, approximately two acres if it's in the air DD, a little bit less than two acres a piece um, uh, so you can get 12 need 12 but if you only wanted to plot out five or something maybe four uh, lots that would leave you with something greater than ten and a half acres, mm -hmm. which then could at a later date come back in and be resubdivided and broken up, leaving a whole going through the whole additional process. Yes, correct. And so, yes. the, so the proposal tonight would be that if you had that that ten acres that might get further subdivided, you assign one unit to it, so that if somebody did want to just put that one house on it, you've already reviewed the project as if development was going to happen there. 
So we used to have folks who would look at subdivision design in ag rural and they would see that big lot, you know, they'd see the little house lots and they'd see the big lot and they'd see part of that lot shaded out as open space and somebody in the audience or the board would point to that and say, but that whole lot's not open space, they're just going to come back and develop over there. And the answer was, yes, the bylaw is forcing applicants to anticipate all of the potential development and design the subdivision accordingly. So we think the staff's recommendation as it relates to growth management follows that precedent. And to confirm that staff's recommendation is backed up by the vote from the select board. Yes. So, it, so it's not a recommendation. It's that's now well, it's now part of the unified bylaw. The bylaw doesn't say so much about what to do with growth management, but we have had a practice going back at least the last 10 years that if you create a lot in Williston, in a residential zone, you've got to get allocation for that lot or you've got to call it open space. Um, it's just, it's cleaner to do that than to create essentially a limbo lot that is, that is neither open space uh, nor anticipated to be developed. Does the score assigned to the development that's being proposed have any bearing on the future score that is given down the road? Well, when they come to subsequently. So if let's say somebody has that remainder lot, they don't intend to develop it today, but but they've gotten the one unit of allocation as staff has proposed here. If somebody came back and simply wanted to put one house on that lot, they've already got their allocation. They can come in for discretionary permit. There's a site plan review to develop that lot, um, and and that's it. If somebody comes back and says, well, you know, I I created that remainder lot, but I, I really want it to be two or three or or five lots you go through the whole process, pre-application, a new growth management allocation score, and schedule discretionary permit. Um, Is there any relation in terms of the scoring, though? Yes. So one of the things we would be looking at is the, the history of the creation of that lot would be that it came out of this larger lot that also got a score. And you wouldn't want anything about the design on that lot that came out of that bigger subdivision to undermine the decision the DRB had made before. So it's seen as an amendment to that larger subdivision when you come back and do that and it's important uh, for the staff and the DRB to always make sure that whatever further subdivision whatever further amendments to that project happen going forward that that original allocation score in that competitive process is still likely to be the score the project would get in other words, you, you can amend things, but you don't want to amend something such that everything you promised at growth management, you're, you're, you're taken back. Um, that, has to be, that has to be part of the consideration. So you would potentially get credit for things that were developed with the original development, say paths, mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily building additional paths mm -hmm. on this smaller piece. You might get the the 10 or 20 points for the paths be, that were from the original project. So, by by way of example, um, Finney Crossing project in the Growth Center has been through 14 or 15 amendments now, and some of them have involved shuffling of growth management allocation or requests for additional allocation. Every time that that project has been scored in those subsequent amendments, we've looked at the totality of the project. So, you know, there's a build paths and trails incentive. Does the project build a path and trail? Yes. Does it have to build another new path and trail every time it comes back? No. Gets credit for what's part of the overall project. It's also held to those conditions. They're not necessarily asking for additional units of allocation, though, were they? Uh, Finney was in, in one, one case, case yes. but in the others, no. And the others, there, there were just um, shuffling a any amendment to Finney. Okay. So Finney got points for paths and trails. Okay. If a shopping center was proposed at Finney that suddenly was going to take a path or trail uh -huh. out of it, we would have to remind, we would want to remind the board, hey, this project scored in part based on the provision of this path. How are you going to make sure the project still would get that score? Okay. Right. Any, yeah. any other? Any other questions from the board regarding this process? This part of the process? <laughs> it's pretty part of the Anybody, process. any comments or yeah. name, so, name and address, please? Uh, Craig Sampson, uh, 120 Rosewood Drive. So my question, um, I'm allowed to address Matt, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Matt, my question then, and that makes a lot of sense, um, and I understand why it's being done, um, and if that lot is 
let's say a 5.25 acre to the side lot that I never want to develop, um, or I might. Um, what you're saying is, is that if that's put to the side, it goes to development review, review board in the future, but it doesn't have to go back to growth management the following March. Correct? As long as it's still only looking for that one unit, correct? So if I put that five and a quarter or so, let's you know, number out of my hat to the side, and I'm going to say that's going to have one house on it, or do I have to say right now I want to have three houses on there? No. Um, so, you know. We're we're recommending that you say you're going to put one. So it's automatically allowed one. It's allowed one because because generally the baseline is a parcel developable at all or not is judged on can you put a house on it. So what we're we're trying to make sure is that we're not creating any parcels that aren't either developable with at least one house or permanently protected open space that everybody agrees is never going to be built on. We don't want to create anything that's in between those two statuses. And the second half of the question then is this, because that makes sense to me. Thank you for the answer. The second half then would be, um, let's say that the remaining 25%, uh, so since you know I donated 75% to open space, um, can it be more than one lot created, or is it the remaining space is one lot and a discussion? Or can it I depends, say it depends on how big the it depends on how big the lot is. Okay. Um, and. Um, what the standard is for lot development, which in out you know in your way in the ARZD is just under two acres, right? Well, minimum yeah, density of eighty thousand square 80, feet. Square feet. Lot size is a little different, but right. So you 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 could come back. You're in your example, Craig. Five five acres. It's got one unit of allocation, and you could come to me and say. Well, really, that I'd like three houses on those five acres. And the answer would be, okay, well, you need to start with pre-application. You need to come back to growth management to get your two other units, go through discretionary permit. If you came and said, hey, that five acres, I want to build one house on it. And let's just say that the, the siting and design and everything of that one house had not been part of the discretionary permit process that followed the growth management hearing, say, well, that's, that's sort of phase two of that project's discretionary permit. It's still got to, even for one house, it's got to come back to the DRB and, and be fully designed um, and, and run up against the bylaw requirements and the site design requirements. And still come together in the fall and, and you know, abutting landowners will get letters. And right. It's, it's either... Not, it's not all tonight and then I'll develop it five years down the road, two years down the road, one month down the road and nobody has to be notified because it was all discussed tonight. That's not what it's going to happen. Right. So one of, one of the reasons for this, um, the idea of essentially deferring some of that review to a subsequent phase is that it's, it's not free to design development on these lots. So somebody who says, I just want these two lots right now. Here's your 75%, but I've got this other land over here I might want to give to my kids someday but I don't want to make it part of my discretionary permit right now because if I do that, I've got to design septic systems and I've got to design driveways and do all these other things. So what we're proposing is, is we take it through to the growth management stage and then the applicant decides what's going to be their phase one, what unit, units are going to be part of the subsequent hearing process. Anything that's not part of that hearing process will need to be part of a different hearing process under a separate application. Right. And just to clarify, and if they were going to put, wanted to put more than just that one unit on that site, the they start all the way back at the beginning sure. with the pre-application. Correct. Regardless of the outcome of Tonight. everything that's come to this point and then growth management. Right. So you're not saying, yeah, we'll rubber stamp it and you're, you're good, just do what you want later, later on the road. That, that, that makes sense. That, that sounds like there's some due diligence done there and some, some work to... That, that makes sense to me. Nothing sneaky. No. Yeah. You know, that's, and, and I'll just say anecdotally from the staff perspective, you know, we sometimes get people who just call us out of the blue and say, I've got this land, I want to split it into three lots, give one lot to each of my kids, but I, I don't want to develop it. Can I just come in and do that administratively? And for the last decade, the answer has been, no, you need to subdivide pre-application growth management. Oh, but they don't want to build right now. <laughs> We need to assume if we're creating a lot that eventually there's going to be either a house on it or it's going to be an open space lot. That's, so that's the reasoning behind all of this. And if I may, um, you just brought something to my mind. Um, where that leftover piece of property, that parcel, so to speak, it's going to be this is where it's at. It's not, well, I can take 5.25 here 
here or there or mm -hmm. here. No, they're creating a lot. Creating mm -hmm. a lot. It's Correct. It doesn't lot. doesn't move doesn't move around. It doesn't move around. Mm -hmm. Creating a lot. Because remember, what's left over is open space, and the idea in Williston's bylaw is that open space is established in perpetuity, and that open space lot hopefully doesn't move at all. We've had occasions rarely where someone's had to adjust a line a little bit um, on open space, but fundamentally. That open space per our bylaw is, is supposed to be forever and ever. Okay. Yeah. James 4997. On the open space, is that the um, town's land? No. Not by default. It's simply designated and the you know, making it open space means you can't build houses on it, um, can't build parking lots on it, um, things like that. At a minimum, when open space in Williston is designated as part of this process, the not being able to do anything on it becomes an element of zoning enforcement. So if somebody went out and, and uh, built their garage on the open space, they would get a notice of zoning violation from me. Okay, can that open space be used with the public, or is that just open space? It's, it does not have to be publicly accessible. Um, there's another still, part still of this. Still private. Still privately owned. There's another part of this process where uh, applicants sometimes will offer up public trail easements. Um, this uh, process incentivizes open space in, in terms of actually giving open space to the town if the town deems it a desirable resource, or open space that's enforced via third party, like having a Vermont land trust easement. But the town recognizes in its bylaw here, we can't make people do those things. We, we, we can't, you know, shake an applicant down and say, you've got to give us three quarters of your right, land. Right, you want right, right. Yeah, this is not, this is not the, the taking of private land. I think it's, that, that topic has come up, you know, once or twice before. That is not what's going on. But what it really is is, what it really is is designed to provide, provide for and maintain the character of Vermont mm -hmm. open space, right, farms and... Um, open vistas and clustering of homes and you know and, and if you're only allowed if you're allowed to develop 25 percent of the land by rights you're going to be clustering your homes around in in a certain area of any given parcel and leaving the remainder remainder open um, forever the last thing we want to see is you know we, we really is is houses spread out everywhere we want to see open open spaces so that, that is the idea behind this uh, any other questions We've got one quick question in regards to uh, phase one and the phase two. Name and address, oh, please. Oh, pardon me. Kevin Mazuz on 1120 Butternut Road. Um, <clears throat> phase one and phase two, go moving on to um, discretionary permit, part of that process is the inclusion of a um, environmental uh, survey on, on the the development. So, will that be just on the phase one, or does it include phase two? Because I would think they would would kind of affect each other. So, uh, we haven't done this before, and and some of this is up to how the board wants to see that. But we, in in places where we have certain mapped resources, we have requirements for habitat disturbance assessments. I think right. that's what you're referring yes, to. Um, I would I would recommend that an applicant having an, a habitat disturbance assessment done. Uh, you know, have the wildlife biologist who performs that know that this lot's not proposed for development today, but it could be eventually. And so therefore, it's part of the consideration of the impact on resources. If that lot needs to shift, you know, the, the commitment is to provide open space. Open space is required to protect certain resources in ag rural. If, if a habitat disturbance assessment came back and said, uh, well, that lot, even though you say, you know, you're going to, you're leaving the possibility of developing it out there someday. If it gets developed, it's going to have an adverse impact. And if it gets shifted a little bit, then it won't. I would encourage the DRB to, you know, encourage that. Because even in that phase one, there's going to be a plat. There's going to be a final plat at the end of, a, of the first phase of development review. It's going to establish all of the lot lines, including the lines of the lots that might not get developed until somewhere in the distant future. So in, in considering resources, you know, if somebody had one of those lots, let's, let's pick an obvious example. They had that remainder lot entirely in a class two wetland. We would, we would want to kind of flag that and say, you know, we, you, you, you probably shouldn't do that because it, it will end up not being developable 
down the road and the same thing would be true for under the terms of the habitat disturbance assessment if somebody said well this is fine for lots one and two but lot three is um, really impactful and, and shouldn't be approved then that should be addressed up front as part of that first phase of review okay. thank you yep and any um you want to cover any of the affordable housing changes yeah um a, a few other things um the these are actually not the changes but just a few things about allocation so people often ask us well how do you know how that 80 unit uh, year target is distributed geographically across time how do you know what's still available the answer is and has been for a long time we have a spreadsheet a giant spreadsheet it's part of the drb staff report and it identifies what's available what's left to be allocated and so in each allocation year in each of the three geographic regions of town three quarters of the allocation is for for any kind of unit and one quarter of the allocation is only available for the construction of affordable housing so this is housing that's affordable at either 80 100 or 120 percent of the area median income for the given household size um, and will and it's only for housing that will be made available perpetually at that level so um, the town incentivizes affordable housing both by awarding points and growth management for it and by actually setting aside some of those 80 dwelling units a year just for affordable housing um, so sometimes when we talk policy with the select board about affordable housing say what if we really got 80 units a year? What would that look like in Williston? Because the truth is we get somewhere between 50 and 60 years. So, well, if you got 80, a whole quarter of them would be affordable <laughs> um, because they're set aside especially for that. Uh, I will touch briefly on, I think, Scott, what you alluded to, which is there was another change adopted by the select board, which says that if you're building units that will be affordable at or below 80% of the area median income, this is the most affordable category Williston has, those units do not have to receive allocation through this process anymore. They can be built essentially for free without going through this process. Uh, we do not have any projects on the docket tonight that are proposing affordable um, at or below the 80 percent. Clarify that and say they don't have to go through growth management; they still have to go through pre-app and discretionary permit. All, all the other stuff. All the everything else. They just don't have to go through the process here, here to go through tonight. They don't. They don't come out of this target. Um, so, keeping in mind, I think growth management involves a limited number of new units that can be created every year. Those units are not distributed evenly across the town, but are geographically divided into three specific areas. Um, we, we're, we're dividing um, by year, and in each year we're also dividing by affordable versus market, and all of that goes into what's available. Um, the board also has some rules about not being allowed to give all of the allocation away all the way out into the future. Uh, and also about not being allowed to give all of the allocation away to any one project. So there are whole back provisions related to that. Um, but all of that said, what, what most of tonight's hearing, uh, what we're going to spend time doing is one at a time going through the projects, going through the answers that the applicants gave to the growth management surveys. The surveys are designed to elicit responses related to the items that are incentivized and scored in growth management. I think, Scott, the process has normally been that um, the project proponents are called up one at a time. The staff will give a brief overview of the draft score in the project, and then there can be a Q&A about each project. And then you'll close up your hearing and deliberate. Yep. OK. So let's do it. Okay, fine. So let's start with. Uh, I get to my right thing. We're going to start with North. That one was dropped. Okay, we're not starting with North. Yeah, if um, <laughs> if anybody is wondering why did the Northridge project withdraw, uh, Northridge was not asking for new allocation. They were asking for a reordering of their allocation schedule, and. Be because of the rule change that allows you to simply build in sequence, those yeah, kinds of requests to. are no longer needed in our system. Because they can build all of them starting in that first year, Once so they, they don't need to push yeah. them forward. That's right. Northridge will be returning to the board at some point to ask for allocation for its 
subsequent phases of development I did not receive full allocation. But this was a reordering that <coughs> they have withdrawn. Well, that's 20% of our work. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. No Northridge. Next, we're going to uh, we're going to go right to Adams Real Properties. Um, and um, as we uh, as we do get going, I did note some people walk in the door after we started. Um, if you have not signed in, please do so. Okay. I think I saw three people sign in. I'm not sure if you signed in or not. But if you haven't, please do so. Uh, Jason, state your name and your address, please, for the record. Jason Adams, 207 Boyer Circle. Okay. Right. Emily, it looks like you, huh? Yep. Um, Adams Real Properties LLC proposes a nine-lot mixed-use subdivision on 41 acres located at 700 Mountain View Road in the residential zoning district. The applicant proposes six single-family units, three multi-family units, one child care facility, and open space. The property has an inherent right to build one unit. Um, staff recommends an overall proposed score of 31 points. Going through the applicant's questionnaire, the applicant proposes um, four um, five-star or LEED certified homes, um, which brings the score to two points for conserve energy. Um, for build affordable housing, no affordable units are proposed for a proposed score of zero points. Offer housing choices. Um, six of the units will be um, single family dwellings, three multifamily units um, in one building. The single family homes will each be on their own parcel. Um, and then the three units will be um, the multifamily units on their own parcel. Um, and they will be um, owned um, by Jason Adams or another agency um, occupied by a tenant. Um, and the applicant provides a description about the range of home sizes provided, um, what the build out could potentially look like. Um, based off of that, um, for the score for offer housing choice, we've proposed 10 points. Um, provide neighborhood space. Um, we've offered one point in this category. Um, the purpose of neighborhood space is um, a building space such as a meeting room, fitness center, daycare center, or another neighborhood space acceptable to the DRB. In this case, the daycare center would be something private for the residents, whereas the proposed daycare use is its own individual commercially owned parcel. Um, the applicant has proposed um, a cul-de-sac in the middle of the proposed road to be a neighborhood space um, with a bench or possible community garden, um, thus our score of one point. Build paths and trails. Um, the nine units will be served by the town's path and trail system. Um, the applicant is proposing 1,786 feet of a trail segment and is building that path um, to connect um, the proposed development to Brennan Park. Um, the DRB did request at pre-application um, that the applicant explore a connection between Katy Lane and Brennan Park, and that has been shown on the applicant's attached site plan, an unimproved primitive trail running parallel to Mountain View Road. <clears throat> uh, design for context. Um, the home, the development is near Katie Lane's and Brennan Woods neighborhoods, um, primarily single family home residential dwellings. Um, lot seven proposed off Hannon Drive is a single family home. Um, in this case, we've provided a score of five points for design for context. Um, build close to services, the project scored zero because it's not within the um, adequate radius within a focal point, either in the growth center or the village zoning district. Um, and for neighborhood design, the last ca category of the eight categories, we've proposed three space, um, three points, um, because the open space, um, how it's arranged um, to provide 
functional needs, buffering, and stormwater management. Um, there is some land that is um, not open space, but deer rentering area on a privately open owned parcel that is proposed. Um, so together, staff has come to the conclusion of a proposed score of 31 points. This is above the 30 point minimum. The applicant is requesting eight units of allocation, and we have recommended eight units of allocation. However, the um, schedule you see on your yellow sheet um, will be revised because Northridge withdrew. So we propose four units in fiscal year 2020 and four units in fiscal year 2021 for this project. Four in 2020 and four in 2021. Correct. Four more in 2021 for a total of six. No, no, four no, and four, four, and then getting rid of the, oh, getting rid of the two yep, and so twenty-two. Scratch and the that project. whole list on the left side and just four and twenty and four and twenty-one. For a total of eight. For a total of eight, and then the ninth unit is an inherent right to build. Thank you. That's what do you think, Jason? Summarizes it pretty well. Any questions from you guys? Questions from the board? Jason, what is the, there's a 30 foot wide uh, easement shown coming out of Katy Lane. Was there any way to extend that primitive trail sort of from Katy Lane to get to Brennan Wood, Woods Park. Yeah, we looked into that, and our uh, and during our habitat assessment, um, because that's a deer wintering area, she recommended that no activity be in there. Okay. So we thought if we designated path, obviously that would increase activity. Right. Okay. So the only path that you've provided here is right along Mountain View Road. What's the Right along Mountain View to to connect uh, to connect to Katie, Katie yeah. Lane into. Okay. Did you explore any? I guess because you've got these homes back here, the back yeah, it was with pr it. Pretty limited. Was there any discussion with the homeowners association for Katie Lane to go sort of through their open space, or is that? No, there wasn't. Does the uh, the non motorized easement that's uh, shown adjacent to your lot um, further kind of that extension of Katy Lane? Does that go anywhere? Does that connect anything? It, I, I believe it's on your lot. There might be some kind of primitive path there, and it leads to another development. Um, but the little kind of dog leg off of it that leads right that's short that goes right into the woods I don't believe there's anything there and in the in the uh, pr proposed trails plan that the town had there it didn't show any real connection from Katie Lane to Brennan Woods um, it did show a path from Brennan Park more or less following our path and sidewalk there which is why we had originally put that So we were we were kind of following the ideal um, or future trails plan. So again, I'm, so I'm now I'm, I'm looking at that path over to the park. There's two different colors shown on that path. Is that does there is there any meaning to that? Or I mean, there are there's a there's a, a text box plan. there and arrows that say a five foot wide path follows general route of primitive trail as shown on map number 17 of the comprehensive plan, and if I if I if I look really close, it looks like there's a, a slightly light darker green line there. Um, sh should that be the same dark green as the rest of that path? I, my uh, copy's not loading in this room very well. I think so. One section shows five foot wide concrete sidewalks 
pointing to the dark green mm -hmm. and then that very faint light green and says five foot wide paved path. So it might be showing a different shade. It might go from concrete uh, yes. to a right. pave, a different paving. Okay. And then the color rendering. Emily, excuse me one second. Any conversations going on in the room while the hearing is going on should take place, ma'am? Any conversation should go on outside. Thank you. Go ahead, Emily. So it looks like it's just um, a bad color choice. Okay. For so there is a path here that's intended from essentially from the the cul-de-sac uh, community space over to Brennan Woods Park. Yes. Yeah. And half of it will be concrete, and half of it will be a, just a bituminous pavement. It was supposed actually from the cul-de-sac. Then you know there's a sidewalk going around that, and from there to the park was supposed to be paved. Um, it was it was originally going to just be a primitive path, but the Public Works Department mm -hmm. said you could not have an unpaved path, which is why we paved it, or mm -hmm. concrete or pavement. Mm -hmm. okay. And it was shown fully paved in the pre-app rendering. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's great. I, I I I I applaud you for putting that path in. I think you'll find a lot of traffic on that. Yeah. Um, I had one question, Emily. Under um, score calculation, um, neighborhood design, you gave you gave me three points mm -hmm. for open space being used creatively. Next box down: permanent protection of open space identified in open space plan will result in an award of one to five additional points on this criterion. Mm -hmm. No points provided in that box. Mm -hmm. Why not? What um, was the idea? What was the idea? There's an awful lot of open space that have been designated. It's the difference between designated an open space and then having a third party agreement. So, mm -hmm. second box is the open space plan and the extent resource being protected. Permit for the zero to five, and then you can get the additional bonus points if this is only a category in this um, area where you can get extra points for that. Permanent protection with a third party easement, Vermont Land Trust, et cetera. Okay. All right. Any reason why you wouldn't want to do that? You designated it and designating it as open space, anyways. Yeah, I mean, you don't, I'm not saying Tru you have to. Yeah, um, I truthfully just don't know really anything about it. Yeah. So. The process. If, it, if it came down to it, that again, as we've stated before, this is a competitive process. If there was a another project that scored a few points higher than you, mm -hmm. then it doesn't. I mean, you're, you're designating it as open space anyways. If you're retaining ownership of it, right. but you're not going to be able to use it right. down the road. It, so it's, it's something. It's something. You know, whether it's for this project or in the future, you might want to think about. It. And it still could be done. It wouldn't affect it, it points could, or anything, it, but it, it still could be done. But yeah. from a scoring from a scoring perspective, it wouldn't you wouldn't gain anything right. now because we're working on it as of right now. Mm -hmm. so, okay, all right. Um, question: uh, Further questions from the board? No. No. Nope. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. sir, name and address. Oh, um, I don't have a copy of the, the thing in front of me that's uh, easy to read, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, this, this question is primarily directed at Matt um, with regard to your earlier conversation about open space. The bottom, I think it's roughly 17 acres, is lot seven plus the deer wintering area. Could you comment on what is what might be possible to happen to that deer wintering area in the future, given the way this project is structured, and given the description you gave of the open space? Sure. <coughs> so I'll, I'll begin by uh, clarifying, and this might answer the whole question. Um, the requirement to set aside perpetually protected open space and the 75% is only in the agricultural rural residential zoning district. Which this, this is not. This is not. This is in the residential zoning district. 
So in, in the case of a project like this, the town still has open space values that are expressed in the scoring and, and the way Emily went over the draft score, but it's not quite the same as the hard and fast requirement that you get in Ag Rural. Um, the reason that we still think about things like wetlands and deer wintering areas is because we also have natural resource protection standards in the bylaw that apply to all development everywhere in town. Um, likely, when something shows up like that as a uh, deer wintering area, there's very little that can happen to it going forward. Um, whether it's because of the habitat disturbance assessment, which you know, <coughs> everybody is going to say, develop somewhere else, or stay out of it. Um, the finality of the subdivision permit that, that would ultimately result from a process like this. Um, number of reasons, even if there's not that absolute set this aside and designated perpetual open space, there's a lot of reasons that you wouldn't see further development in the deer wearing area in Williston. I was also told kind of informally that I think it's the state fish and wildlife maybe. It would cause a lot of problems trying to do anything in there. Our, our experience is whenever a &R, uh, the Agency of Natural Resources at the state has had the opportunity to enter into any proceedings about development in Williston, if there's deer wintering area, they've advocated very strongly that that area not be impacted by even so much as a primitive trail. Can I answer your question? Uh, yes, I, I have a related question about that same lot. So it's unlikely that the deer wintering area would, would be a prospect for future development, but the, the shape of Lot 7, I believe, goes all the way from Cannon Drive roughly over to the Katy Lane development. It's, it's like a, 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 what is that, a trapezoidal shape, um, uh, the, the width of the property. What would have to be done? Um, I'm, I'm envisioning the, the nature of my concern is we're we're probably one of the more affected um, houses in Brandon Woods by any proposed development here, especially Lot Seven. Um, we're, we're the house 371, right right across the street from Lot Seven, the, the proposed house on Lot Seven. So we have a concern about um, development of that lot and specifically possible future development of the, the whole space of that lot. What would be the scenario which would result in more than one dwelling being placed in that rather large space there? So um, let's let's assume that this subdivision went through the, the full approval process um, and Lot 7 was created as it's shown with the building envelope for the one house as it's shown. Um, any, any changes to that, number one, would, would require you know, a, a rehearing with the Development Review Board, the full process, pre-application, growth management, discretionary permit, final plans. Um, would have to be reviewed as an amendment to this proposal and, and as I sort of belabored with the board a little while ago, would have to be reviewed against the way this proposal was scored, allocated, and approved. And I would say that given that there are some points being offered, um, potentially adopted by the DRB related to open space, the board would be well advised to, to leave the open space alone, essentially, in any subsequent review of this. Um, you know, there, there is an idea here, um, even when we're even when we're in the residential zoning district, that we're trying to come up with um, a a plan for the totality of development that might take place going forward on this parcel. And that there's some feeling of finality coming out of this process um, that the board, the neighbors, the applicant all understand that this this is the development that's going to go forward and generally no more. That said, I never say never, and I never say no problem, and I never say forever, because I just cannot promise those things. The whole bylaw could change fundamentally uh, in 25 years, and, and the conversation would be different. That said, in addition to the winter area, there's a pretty big wetland on that area to the, to the uh, south. It's a little hard to see in the dark green there. Um, but there's a, there's a wetland area. It's going to come with a town-established 50-foot buffer. Um, 
a, a lot of reasons not to further develop that portion of the parcel. Okay. Does, the, does the area outside of the building envelope constitute open space? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I, I mean, I would, um, if, if I were administering permits for this, so let's say somebody built this house and they had this subdivision and building envelope, they wanted to build a shed, a garage, an accessory structure, a pool, I would, as the zoning administrator, say that's fine, you need to do it inside of this building envelope. Um, that's, that's part of administering this subdivision going forward. I, th I think that um, you, you've seen this, I think, correct? You have, okay, yeah. I mean, it's, it, 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 this is an interesting parcel. This is an interesting parcel in that it's a big piece of land, um, but it is heavily constrained, it, which is which if if this came in in this zoning district, perfectly flat with no wetlands on it and no deer wintering area on it, you could put a lot of houses on here by by the bylaw by by what's allowed in the bylaw, but because it because it is so heavily constrained with wetlands and um, uh, wildlife habitat. It, it, this is about what you get uh, in terms of um, in terms of the areas available um, to develop. To develop. Now, I, I will also echo Matt saying, "Yeah, you know, obviously, you never say never because we've we've seen things change. We all know we all know that." Um, um, but those are those are two areas. There are those are two areas which, while they may change, are probably pretty unlikely to change, uh, given given this given. The, um, what the state wants and what the town wants. So. Ma'am, um, name and address? Linda Kaiser, 471 Hannon Drive. I am not an abutting property, but I'm nearby. Um, I think it would be a shame to develop this lot seven. I think it would really change the character of Brennan Woods. I think there would be a disruption to a lifestyle in Brennan Woods with the construction trucks, etc. I've lived there for 20 years. I've worked for Snyder as a salesperson. I'm a realtor now. I, I think it would be a real shame. Um, I have no objection to the total project, but it would really change things in Brennan Woods. And I hope it doesn't happen. And I have nothing against Jason, but he is the president of our board our homeowners association. He lives in Brennan Woods. Nobody knows what's going on in Brennan Woods with this on Lot 7 on Hannon other than us telling people. And people are upset about it. Okay. That's All right. It. Thank you. Ma'am? Laura McClure, 140 Barrett Lane, which is Brennan Woods as well. I just have a general question for the review board. Since it, when, if and when Lot 7 gets developed, that house will have a direct outlet into Hannon. So it will basically be in Brennan Woods. And Brennan Woods has covenants and homeowners association rules and stuff. How does the board treat stuff when a property gets put into and developed into an existing neighborhood that already has its own covenants? Are there any so it's not in Brennan Woods. Um, it, it, has, it has nothing to do with Brennan Woods. Um, there is an easement from Hannon into the property. Um, it is in its it is on its own parcel. It is it is not not now nor will be restricted by any of the covenants in Brennan Woods. It is a separate piece. It is a separate piece of property. Although it sits in the boundaries of Brennan Woods. Does not sit in the boundaries of Brennan Woods. It sits outside the boundaries of Brennan Woods. That seems strange to me. Did you drive into the neighborhood? No, oh, you're right. You absolutely do. But okay. Brennan Woods. But Brennan Woods is Brennan Woods Road. Is a public road. It's not privately owned. It, it was yeah, yeah, Hand and Drive. I'm sorry. Yes, Hand and Drive. I, my mistake. But it's 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 public. It's publicly owned. It was deeded to the town of Williston when the when the uh, when the development was built. Um, and none of the covenants have anything no, apply to the public road. Um, so they so the public, any public, every public person, entity has access to that road to use it for transit. Uh, or access to another piece of land, which in this case is what Lot Seven is. So that's that's not something the board created. Uh, that's, no, I understand. Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> I wonder if there's any future thought to. I, I know legally it's strange, but it's 
it's also difficult for a homeowners association to have a new piece of property developed that we have no say over and have no um, ability to regulate when the neighbors right next to them are going to have regulations on them for size of house, the, the color of the house, the whether you can store boats on your property. All of that stuff exists within our neighborhood. And this being built, which I'm, I mean, people buy property, they have every right to develop it. I'm not against development. I just am a little concerned about how that plays out. Yeah, it's an, it's an, it's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Um, uh, I think everybody on the board would probably agree with that. Um, when Brennan Woods was, was developed, this easement was put in place. So anybody who was in, 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 in Brennan Woods back when they bought into, into the development, this, if they dug deep enough, now probably nobody ever does, <laughs> right? But if they dug deep enough, they would have found out that there was an easement into this piece of property. Um, probably pretty similar to if you go to the opposite side of the parcel, there's an easement sitting over there as well. Um, uh, because of that, it, it allows access to a, another piece of property for future development, having nothing to do with Brennan Woods. Okay. I, I, yeah, no, and, I'm, and this, I'm more just kind of trying to explain to you why it, why it's, why it is that way. Um, right, not right, not wrong, it just kind of is. I think it's an easement because when I was looking at the plat, a pre-application, the right-of-way for Hannon Drive Did I takes use, over I that. I the wrong term. Kind of, it was an interesting conundrum when I was looking at the plat when this came in originally. There's that triangular pie-shaped piece where Hannon Drive cur curves, and that whole piece is part of the Hannon Drive right-of-way shown on the Brennan Woods plat. So that the big, thick, dashed line of the edge of Jason Adams' property that abuts directly onto Hannon Drive right of way, which is the road and some green space next to the road. Yeah, essentially the right of way of Hannon Drive is stretched over to meet the property line of the subject parcel. Mm -hmm. So it, it has um, access on a public road. A whole bunch of whole bunch of frontage on the right of way. But it yeah. but it is the right of way of Hannon Drive and not open space. Really within Brennan Woods, which Correct. is a very different uh, designation. Correct. Right. So it's, it's just part of the right of way of Hannon Drive as it was um, offered and deeded over to town. Ma'am? Um, Christina Newman, also 371 Hannon Drive. Um, I uh, have three thoughts. Um, first, I would like to second uh, Wendy's thoughts that um, this uh, would be um, uh, disruption into an existing neighborhood. Um, people bought into an existing neighborhood being having been told over years and years and years that it was a finished neighborhood, nothing could be built there. Um, my second thought is I would like to um, echo Laura's thoughts that while there not be a legal basis, um, taking into account the um, uh, um, established uh, neighborhood uh, with a home and association and the impact on that by inserting a house that is not part of that association, however the legal situation may be, I think there is a lot of good um, um, reason to think about that from a community or existing neighborhood perspective, to be a good neighbor, to have that um, uh, be, uh, take part in that uh, neighborhood, in that association, to um, be part of those standards. Um, we understand that from a building perspective that is important, that the house looks that way. It's also important that people behave that way um, and um, to um, uh, that way um, give some consideration and thought and weight to that to encourage that um, behavior. And um, my um, uh, also being uh, associations uh, play an important role to keep a neighborhood like this uh, up to standards, which is important from um, a value perspective and uh, in the end, the income to the town of Williston, rather than to allow a borough like this to be ins inserted um, to that possibly has a negative impact on the existing um, houses in the neighborhood. Um, so I would encourage you to think about that. Um, my third thought is the uh, specifically the impact on us, the houses directly across the street from us, and because of that tiny sliver that abuts directly <laughs> onto Hannon Drive, I'm going to be looking at cars coming in and out of that driveway. And I did not pay $400,000 to look at a driveway. The board seems to understand the value of open space and looking at nature and get nice views. And uh, to pay that much money to look at a driveway is just not my idea of a good view. So I would encourage you to think about that too. And is there another way that can be encouraged to be managed to not have that drastic of an impact of an existing house in that neighborhood? Okay. All right. I, could I just add, I, I believe in my... Uh, 
questionnaire, I did state that I will keep that look. I think I said a colonial house to, to blend in with the neighborhood to some degree. Um, so there was that consideration. I don't know how. Yeah, obviously there's variations. Most of the houses in the neighborhood are, there's maybe four variations, but there are a few that are a little different. So there is some play, I think, in there. But generally, this the I stated in my application that I'll keep it a colonial house to at least blend in and try to be as good of a neighbor, I guess, as possible. Can I ask, will you be, um, are there trees? I'm assuming there are trees all in front of this property. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it appears from <clears throat> your rendering in this photo that the house will be set back similar to the house that would be the next closest on the same side of the road. Yeah. Um, so is your intention, I mean, you have a, a quite a, a deep lot there. Is your intention to construct the house relatively similar in terms of setbacks as the other yes. houses in Brendan Woods? Yeah. And so will you be clearing the entire front of the house for that construction, or is there an intention, or will there be an intention to leave some of that you know, some of the wooded area, as is consistent with, I know Brennan Woods has some of those houses set back a little bit further with developed and grown trees in the, their front yards in that area. Yeah. Well, let me just add one, add, add, add a part of that. Is there a building envelope that's been designated for for that house? Yeah, it's yeah. shown right there. Yeah, it's shown. Do I, do I see it's, yeah. it's on, it's dashed. It's quite deep. There's a note. It's, it's large. To the left. Yep. Yep. This, this is actually all part of that lot, too. Yep. But this is the envelope right here. Okay. All right. I guess, okay, go I guess it, was there any consideration given to maybe making it set back further and having a bit of a longer driveway so that the impact visually might be reduced to an offended it, neighbor? There wasn't really. I mean, to be honest, we were trying, our, our thoughts were to make it blend in as best as possible, which would be keeping it similar to the other 174 houses on that, you know, on those streets in that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and so again, that, then that sort of leads me to my second part of the last question, which is those houses were developed in the 80s, I presume, or I'm sorry, 90s and 90s, two th early 2000s. Five year build out. Right. So they're about a 20 year growth on trees and other things that have occurred since then. But I think that I don't think there was a ton of clear cutting in a, that area. Well, a lot of the growth in here, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, but it, it there's not a lot of, at some point this was cleared, this yep. this strip that remains white on that plan. Okay. So you have a lot of smaller. There's more shrubbery. Trees, and, shrubbery, stuff like that. Um, the history of that, I, I don't know why that was done, um, but it's, the woods, the deer wintering area is heavily wooded. The other part that's in lighter green on your plan that has kind of a stream going through it is pretty pretty wooded. So there is a definite gap. That's that strip that remains white. At some point, something was done there. You had a comment, Pam? I did. Um, it's pretty clear. Um, the, there's open area and then it's wooded. Um, I, like I said, I've, I've lived in Brennan Woods for 20 years and I worked for the Snyders and I sold the last phase of Brennan Woods, 22 houses including the model house. There are eight house styles per the Act 250 permit, eight. You can change the elevation slightly, but there's eight house styles. You can change the color of the siding there's a few porch styles. You can't, they have the freeze board across the top. You can't put mantles. I mean, but you, you could not make any changes or it would invalidate the Act 250. But there are some without the freeze board. And like the, I think it's maybe two or three down from the Bradshaws that like the garage, it's a lot longer. It's like a story and a half, kind of like a, so it's it's totally it looks totally different. Um, so that's the one that kind of like that's one of an example of. Now is it a colonial? Is it probably the floor plan inside? They're similar? all the same, Jason. Well, they just 
Oh, okay, I, I drive by it pretty frequently too. I mean, um, they're really. There is one that stands out right there. What and there are it? variations. Like uh, I drive by one every day that has a full two, a full story above the garage, where most of them are nothing or a half story. Well, they so there are not, slight. They have bonus rooms. Right, but this is one has a full story. So I'm just saying there are variations. No. It, oh. I do I do drive by through the neighborhood every day. So. May I ask one more follow-up question in terms of some of uh, some of what I've heard um, from the neighbors is that there is some interest in if this lot were to be developed to make it subject to the covenants um, has there been any consideration of that because there would obviously be benefits like to a potential buyer to be able to use the pool facilities for example or you know there'd be some benefits as well as detriments to something like that I had brought up at the last meeting that I believe that the association pays for sidewalks to be cleared or, uh, during the winter um, this would obviously get the benefit of that without having to contribute to those to, to that um, so there are a couple of things that perhaps could be, Im be impacted by this lot or could they could benefit from or be impacted from has there been any consideration to that and discussion perhaps with the board? It sounds like you're involved yep. at the board. Yeah, we had a meeting back in December. Um, it's basically been a waiting period. I'm, I mean, I'm not committing to anything specific of how it's going to go because, you know, we've been in a waiting pattern for a few months now. And although things have changed, but if, if I couldn't build, you know, a house for two years, say, because of the growth management process, my thought would be totally different than if I could have built eight in the first year, which now you can. So going into this, there there hasn't been a I've, I've basically been telling everyone we're, I'm waiting for this meeting, waiting for prices on the infrastructure, and then I have to go from there. Right. Well, in terms of my own review of this, I might, um, you know, I might score um, the... Um, Design for context a little, you know, a little bit differently. If I knew that lot seven was proposed to be, you know, some some somehow subject to the declaration and bylaws of Brendan Woods, um, and were to be subject to some of the, you know, so yeah. so again, that could impact at least well, my. And in, and in the meeting with the, I believe it was just the board there. Um, there was discussion about it, and s I can't remember if it was. possibly selling part of that wooded area that there was some pushback on or adding another house to the thing if there was a push. But there was debate if it would work or in some people, there were some things that some ideas people had, some were against, some were for, right. some were neutral. So and, and the folks that are here seem to be in favor of it, but there may be. Right, but I've also gotten calls about people in Brennan Woods looking to buy a house in this development. So, I mean, you got 174 people. The, Fair enough. The, there's, no side, there's no sidewalk on that side of uh, Hannon Drive on his property. Yeah, there is. Because it's not, is. Part, yes, it's not part of the Brownwood project. There is a sidewalk there, Paul. There yeah, there, is. right. Yeah, there is. It's kind of. I, I walk yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and the, the plowing's only been done for one year on the sidewalk, right. and it's, um, there was. It's going to be kind of a see how it goes thing. There's a sidewalk there. Just there so. Um, so, Joe, I'm glad you brought this back to the concept of the the, the score and and whatnot because. It, that's really what we're here to talk about tonight, not discretionary permit uh, uh, right. issues. But um, to the extent that you're getting a maximum score for design for context, that probably will hold you to a certain level of performance at DP, at least in, in my mind as a, as a uh, board member. So that's the maximum you can get. Yeah. So... Right. Well, like I said, I you know I I, sh I we showed the house on the site plan to kind of mirror what's in that neighborhood for that one specifically. I said in the application <coughs> to keep it a colonial style. Um, and as you can, know, I say it's going to be one of four. I mean, they might not even make the color side. I mean, I don't I, I don't want to pigeonhole myself either. Just saying, it's going to be one of four colors to find out two of those colors don't exist anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, that's true. But on the end, this is a maximum score, which tells me you're doing as much as you can to make this uh, in the context of, right. in its own context. Yeah. And, and again, you, you've got 31 points here. Mm -hmm. You need 30. You don't have a lot of spares. 
I understand that, yep. So 11.8.6, Design for Context, the exact bylaw language says, proposed residential subdivisions should provide a scale of housing, height, bulk, that is compatible with the surrounding uses. This does not mean that the density or mix of housing forms must be identical or very similar. It means that the overall character of the proposed residential subdivision will complement neighboring uses. And then we ask the applicant to describe on how they're going to meet that requirement. In this case, it's a single family dwelling accessed off a public road in a neighborhood of single family dwellings, which is more of the greater form um, of the neighborhood being proposed. But we've taken testimony tonight that says the, there's a plan to use the vinyl siding of a similar. No, I did not say oh, that. You didn't. No, I specifically said I wasn't going to pigeonhole myself to say a specific to that. So uh, this could be metal siding, shingles. It, the, 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 this app at this said colonial. And right. Not, right. I don't. I mean, there's not a lot of. There's not a lot of single slopes to the same color no. vinyl siding. Right. So okay. that tells me that well, there'll be some color of vinyl siding. But there's a, there's such a difference of what this exact. Like I just I I interpret I see more than eight styles of home. Yes, they're all there as a base of four or eight. I don't know how many there's houses eight. in this neighborhood, but there are definite variations on these. Some have dormers. Some have smaller dormers, some have wider dormers. Some have three car garages, some have two car garages. Some have a bonus room above. One, at least one has a full story above. I know one house doesn't have a freeze board. Because um, I specifically, well, for whatever reason, I noticed these things before this project because I live in the neighborhood. Um, so, and if you read the bylaws of Bread and Woods, um, I think, personally, the design standards are it's it's not very specific we hadn't we had someone apply to uh what did they do they made us a, a deck a screen porch and they wanted to put metal side a uh, metal roofing on just the and the the wording in the bylaws said the primary uh roof material has to be asphalt shingle so i see uh a bump out of the house the main house uh, uh front porch all asphalt and then one little shed uh, or one little uh, screen porch have metal, I say the primary is asphalt shingles. And I brought this up to the board when we went through this. They all said, no, it's always been asphalt shingles. I said, okay, that's fine. But I'm just saying there's a lot of interpretation in those rules. Um, I could probably pull them up and read it, but it's basically vinyl siding, wood framed, primarily asphalt shingles. Um, and, the, and there's probably a few more, but it's, I don't want to be held to, uh, a lot higher, a lot more specific standards than, than the whole neighborhood. Is. So but this so was all built by David, one person, David, so of course he's going to use the board, same materials. To, if the board would like to review the design for context that Emily read again, I think the board should do that because it seems like we are getting way off base on um, on this. Okay, so I'd like to remind the board of that. If you'd like to look at that further, I suggest you do that. Um, we're not here to talk about final siding. I don't. I did not hear that. I, you know, I, see, I, 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 I thought I did. I so it was colonial, which could be hardy plank, wood, vinyl. It could be any one of those things. Uh, in a similar sure. style. I, I, I withdraw the question. I, I did. I thought I had heard that. So, and I just want to make sure that we all understand what's being represented. And as we know, the questionnaire is an important piece sure. here. And, sure. and his answers to those are, and, and what is represented yeah. now, we need to hold him to that. Well, we need to hold to, to the bylaw as well. <coughs> yes. <coughs> sure. Okay. Um, sorry to belabor this point, but when I hear the definition of design for context, to me it means, um, and this, this will touch on something that Jill mentioned and something Christina mentioned and something Randy mentioned and something Laura mentioned. I, I hear a lot more than colonial house style or house style. I, I hear um, assimilation into the neighborhood and surrounding. And for me and us and those in Brennan Woods, that means something. For us in particular, that means something slightly different. Talk about Brennan Woods. For Brennan Woods, I'm also on the board of Brennan Woods. And we have struggled with issues of 
folks um, adhering to the bylaws of Brennan Woods. And the last thing my wife and I would want is something across the street from us, directly opposite us, that does not have to um, adhere to the bylaws of Brennan Woods by some quirk of accident of easement or right of way onto the road that is that that we thought we were buying into a closed neighborhood essentially five years ago when we bought into. Specific to us, we also, as my wife mentioned, um, paid for something we're looking at, okay, that we thought was unchanging. That's context. Um, it has trees, it has open space, and this is what we look across at. And so, to, to your point, we look across some, there's a mixture of mature trees and, as Jason noted, more scrub stuff. But to see all that disappear certainly will affect our quality of life and our character. And uh, we've expressed this to Jason, too. Um, so to me, this, is, this all fits into context. Um, a, a, I don't see how a, 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 a maximum score <coughs> could be given to this for context. Uh, by the way, I, just, I didn't premeditate this. I just heard this discussion with this maximum score without taking into account the fact that Lot 7 opens into fronts on, however you want to call it, on, on an established neighborhood that's been established for 20 years. And to me, it means a lot more than the house being a colonial yeah. and having vinyl siding. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other comments? Uh, <coughs> one more thought that goes along the same lines is sure. um, there has been a certain fear if there's a house that's not subject to the bylaws of the neighborhood, um, people running businesses out of and things like that. Um, right now, the association has a way to deal with that, however successful they are dealing with that, but at least they have a way to deal with that. If there's a house in the neighborhood that is not subject to those rules, we might have a business with lots of lawn mowing equipment going in and out all day long. The town um, has those rules too. Yeah. Well, we're, we're having come visit. <laughs> we're having difficulty with them in Brennan Woods so yeah. right now. Yes. So, um, you brought it to the attention of the town. Laura? <laughs> She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. Yeah. So just, just, just to, to voice out where all these concerns are coming from, and we have voiced all of these concerns to Jason directly, and um, uh, just as he's able to, um, to signal um, the um, commitment to build a house that looks uh, like it's fitting in, I would also love to hear um, a signal to that um, he could commit to making such a home um, part of the neighborhood um, in whatever way that can be done. I'm sure there's ways if people are willing to. I will tell you that that would have to be worked out between you and Jason. That is not something this board has the power to do. I we, may not have we cannot impose we cannot impose that Jones that that type of restriction on a separate piece of property. If you want to work it out with him, if you can do that, you can do that. I think well, and and by way of scoring, at least from my perspective as only one member of this board, that would be something that I would consider as part of scoring this particular criteria. May I ask one more staff question? Do we consider the daycare center um, when evaluating this? Um, you can consider it as part of the project if there's um, anything that that particular impacts. I think what Emily went over was the question of whether that counts toward the provision of neighborhood space. So in the residential zoning district, we have projects that provide things like a pool, a clubhouse, a, you know, a common space that might even be a building or a facility. That's not really what we understood this day here to be. It's, it's to be a, you know, a private business, certainly available to somebody living in the neighborhood, also available to anybody else who's seeking child care. So we're not recommending a score that understands that to be a neighborhood space component that scores points in growth management. No, but I was talking about just in, in terms of the context of the neighborhood, designed for context. So that would be the only sort of commercial facility surrounded by yep. single so, family um, homes. Child daycare is the only commercial use other than small home business that's allowed in this zoning district. 
Um, it's, it's allowed in part of the town's fulfillment of its uh, statutory requirements that come out of the state planning enabling legislation that say you need to accommodate child care in your town. Uh, should generally attempt to accommodate anywhere you allow people to live. Um, so I would not, as a staff person, as your staff person, support a finding that providing that in a residential neighborhood was out of context. I would also just say, <clears throat> I, as, I, as it's been said, I do live in the neighborhood. There was absolutely consideration of that when this was designed. If you remember from our last meeting, for the sewer, for all, everything but Lot 7, I have to gravity to a pump station and then pump it, directional bore under wetlands, all to tie into Hannon. If I was looking to do the smartest thing, t t t quite frankly, I would put as many houses on that white strip on Lot 7 as possible and gravity all my sewer and it would cut a huge cost. I do live in this neighborhood. I didn't want, I don't want to see eight condos there either. I put one house in a neighborhood of 174 houses. I made it look as similar on a site plan as you can, similar setbacks. Um, I stated it was gonna be a colonial. Um, I just, my, my intention is not to disrupt the neighborhood at all. And I, I think I've done that by, just by drafting this plan this way. I mean, it, I'm, I'm costing myself a lot of money by doing this. Look like you're about to raise your hand. You. Um, how how would tr potential traffic impact through Brennan Woods be scored? It would not. It would not. One one house. One, one new house. house. No. <laughs> no no the the, the daycare uh, the, the earlier commentary that happened back in the meeting in October, That's one seven. participant raised the issue of. Uh, additional through traffic coming through Brennan Woods Drive onto Hannon and exiting out the south end of our neighborhood being caused by the existence of the daycare up there. And, and my engineer is doing a traffic study. I was kind of under the impression that would be for the permit for the daycare, <clears throat> which is why it wasn't included. It's not done yet. That's why it's not included. Okay. Um, but it is being, it is being done. Um, in response to that comment, so. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's your answer. <coughs> Thanks. Forthcoming. No. For the daycare For the permit, daycare. which is separate than the growth management. That's discretionary permit. Right. Yeah. So it will be, it will be, it'll be discussed in open hearing. Okay. And there, the fees for that daycare could, and I don't know if it's all traffic fees or what, but there is some fee for that, and it, it could be anywhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars. Seven hundred dollars a vehicle trip. Right, Dep and depending on the number of kids there. Yep. So one, basically one trip per child served $700 a trip. So uh, I'll just clarify a little bit. Traffic study was requested by the Development Review Board as part of pre-application review. The, t the time that that's required to be submitted is discretionary permit, which is the step that's coming up. Um, traffic impact study looks at both the number of evening peak hour trips that would be generated, because that's the number we use to assess the traffic impact fee. It would also assess if there were any improvements to uh, Mountain View Road, Hannon Drive, US 2, any of the impacted roads, if there were any improvements to those roads warranted by the additional trips generated by daycare. So when you have a big traffic generator, uh, it's going to generate a certain number of trips, but it may also warrant the installation of a left turn lane on an existing road or the need for an intersection to have a traffic signal instead of a stop sign. Those are the kinds of things that a traffic impact study would address that the DRB would then be able to consider as part of their review. Okay. But I think the thought was that traffic would be more because of the daycare than yeah, residential, one to nine homes. You know, a house generates 1.01 .01 p.m. peak hour trips per house. Other questions? Other questions to the board? Jill? Was there any consideration for the... Um, for anything other than a um, bench in the space in the center of the cul-de-sac? There was, um, I mentioned a community garden if, if the 
kind of demand is there for people. Um, I, I also don't want to just put something there and have it sit yep. growing weeds. Um, it's, it's quite a large space. It's going to be obviously a quiet road. Um, the air, the grass, I did mention in my uh, application, the grass will be mowed regularly. So whether formally or informal, it's a, a playing field for kids. And again, this isn't a busy road, so right. it's relatively safe. Um, we did extend a crosswalk from the path, uh, from the park, uh, along, you know, that multicolored green path. We, we did add a crosswalk there to tie right in so someone can walk directly from Brennan Park uh, to that area to play with their friends, um, crossing a road once, but it will be in a crosswalk. Um, again, it, it's it's kind of the, you know, what do you commit to, and then it's, I, I thought a bench would be good so people could sit there. Um, if, if it was something that would be a community garden is good, a play area is fine. In terms of like a swing set or something like that, that's it, it's been considered in my head, but nothing I wanted to fully commit to. Yeah, yeah, because you've got the community garden literally right, right next door. Right. <clears throat> but if you only had to deal with, you know, five or eight other people, that's maybe easier. Other questions from the audience? Any other questions from the board? One more time? I'd like everybody to get a chance. Some people hold back. So I will tend to ask that question an awful lot. Okay. All right, we're going to uh, move on from DP 1911 Adams subdivision. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next up is um, uh, for a project outside of the service area, Brownell LaMarche, 4354 South Brownell Road. If you would state your name and your address, please. Joe Lamarge, 4354 South Brownhill Road. Great, thank you. Um, Randy Brownell and Joe Lamarge are proposing a five lot subdivision of a 51.3 acre parcel located at 4354 South Brownhill Road in the ARCD. The applicant proposes three single-family dwellings, one open space parcel and one future development parcel. The property has inherent right to build one dwelling unit. It is currently under construction. Um, the applicant is proposing a uh, fifth parcel that is not part of the 75% open space parcel and does, does have development potential, but they're not requesting allocation at this time. The parcel, lot five, is 5.25 acres, has frontage access on South Brennell Road, and is shown as four lots crossed out with black marker on the site plan. Staff has scored this project assuming future development of lot five. With landscaping, the development on lot five could be made minimally visible from South Brownell Road. Scoring the project on the assumption that Lot 5 will not be developed would result in a higher score for design for context and minimize visual impact and an overall score above 30 points. However, that score could be challenged and jeopardize the potential for development on Lot 5 in the future. So that being said, um, the project was scored as if there was going to be development on Lot 5. So um, so I'll just go through the scores. Um, so the applicant is not proposing um, five-star or LEED-certified um, dwelling units for a proposed score of zero. The applicant is not proposing to build any affordable housing for a score of zero. Um, 
the applicant is proposing a trail easement um, and will work with the Conservation Commission to determine um, a desired alignment. Uh, there's, they have about 4,000 feet of existing trails on the property, uh, some of which will be uh, utilized as part of the easement. Um, and so uh, what we considered in the proposed score of eight is that um, they're not just uh, granting an easement, they're, the easement will actually have some built trails on it. So that's um, a little bit above just the, the easement. Um, for design for context, um, the applicant is proposing uh, two single family dwellings on individual parcels. Neighboring properties are single family residences on private lots and the proposed score is five. Um, for conserved open space, conserve open space, um, the proposed score is zero, uh, although the applicant is setting aside 75% of designated open space. Um, none of that, the open space will not be dedicated to the town, uh, nor will it be um, dedicated via conservation easement, um, and it, it will not be dedicated to another public agency, but simply designated as open space, so they get uh, Zero points for that. Um, and then lastly, minimize visual impact. Um, the proposed score is 10. Um, the houses on the, the proposed um, houses on Rosewood Driver will be obscured by trees and forested area. Uh, proposed lot, yeah. Okay, so proposed lot locations are obscured by terrain and vegetation from South Brownell Road. Um, so um, the overall score is 23, and um, it's which is below the 30 point minimum. Um, per the Williston Development Bylaw 11.2.2.2, this project is eligible for the four units of exemption if the board chooses to grant. Um, this project, the exemptions, uh, staff is recommending the following allocation schedule, three units in FY 2020. That's it. Thank you, Melinda. Ma'am, what would you like to add? I don't really even understand what she was I thought we had 30 points. We don't even have 30 points. I, that's my question. I don't know. I thought that we were doing it. So, so I'm a could little you confused. go through again, excuse me sure. one second. Could you go through again the, um, your, your, your a description and analysis of the, of the crossed out development and how it impacts the scoring of the other um, buildings. Yeah, so because that um, the, that leftover land that um, that we as we discussed, um, it would be our recommendation to have you know to go through growth management as if that will be developed at some point in the future. Um, that brings the score for the minimized visual impact down. Um, I think if that, um, without that lot um, being developed in the future sometime, it would, it would probably have gotten a maximum score of 20 points mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's basically. So Matt, this what, was what you were trying to. Trying to cover in your opening. Shadowing this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things we talked about in coming up with a draft score for this project was, well, um, the, the two lots off of Rosewood, in the staff's opinion, qualify to be scored as if the new development on the property would be invisible. So that's 20 points. And so this category... The, 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 two, the, two, the two duplexes. Correct. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, the way this category works is you either get zero points because everything will be totally visible, 
you get 10 points because the project will be minimally visible, the new development on the project will be minimally visible, or you get 20 points because the new development will be invisible. And so we talked a little bit about the, um, the implications of we want to assume that in the, the uh, marker X'd out lot, we want to assume at least one house is going to be built there and assign it a unit because it, it is being left on the table as developable land. And then the question comes, well, do you still score the whole project as invisible? And if you do that, then the future development, any future development that came to before the board for discretionary permit on that X'd out lot would have to come with a design that would render it invisible. invisible. In other words, it would have to come with a design with a um, very large amount of screening around that unit to make it invisible from any public right of way. And so the staff said, well, in assessing this project, we think the more accurate draft score is to score the overall project as minimally visible, not box the development into that X'd out lot into what might be an impossible situation, but then recommend the DRB use its discretion on this project and award three of its available exemption units such that the project could move forward. Because we feel that would create fewer problems in the future for any development review that happens on that subject parcel. Um, you could score it as if everything's invisible. Every, everything that's on the table and gonna be going forward with discretionary permit as far as we know is invisible but you're, you're kicking a can down the road in terms of what the actual design on that lot five would have to look like. It's kind of closer to gaming the system. That you, well, that you'd be, you, for you to, you, what you don't want is someone to come back and say, gosh, I don't know what that DRB was thinking in 2019. How could I have ever made this invisible? Better to anticipate that it's not, score it appropriately, but then what staff is advising is, you know, this project, um, has been through a couple of iterations, has come back to the board with, with a trail that wasn't present when it was under review last year, uh, for the time being has reduced the unit count and deferred some of the review until a later date. Um, staff's recommending the board use its discretion to grant it allocation such that it, it can move forward. Okay. It's up to, Does up that to the make board. sense? A little bit. What I'm hearing though is if I take those four lots off then I'd be better off so I feel like I'm being forced to do that that's what it feels like to me well you're not being forced you're, you're not being you're, forced you're to actually do it at not all. you're getting allocation no no no, no 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 you're not yeah oh nobody's getting allocation oh you we don't get allocation yet. until we vote <laughs> <laughs> right I know but I need the I need the 30 points and I I know I'm not going to get 30 points if I leave those lots that we want to give our children on the table that's correct. You, you, you're in a better position with 30 points, but the board has discretion to award allocation uh, to a certain number of building units that don't meet the 30. And what has been proposed by staff that this board has to ratify if we elect to use those discretionary that discretionary option, the, the staff has recommended that we give you an allocation even with 23 points. I see. Okay. So, I so I, so proceed with, if you don't understand where you're at in this, keep asking questions. Well, I mean, Because I don't that want you helps, to, I don't you know, want you to concede really thought, something you know, that you don't have to. That I, we had the 30 points, and I'm like, what do you mean 23 points? I just, you know, was, now that doesn't mean this. we're going to adopt what staff has recommended. Okay. Okay. Any reason why you're not building, building for, does, um, uh, energy efficient housing? Yeah. That's well, I wasn't, I, no you know, we're not exactly building it. All we want to do is sell a couple of lots. That's all we want to so do. Just, okay. So the people that actually come in to build these might they would be required to build. They'd, or they'd be required to build. It's, I mean, it's a design requirement these days anyway. It's close. I, 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 I will admit that in the past, the, the board and the staff have kind of glossed over this and said, oh, well, of course, everybody's going to build five star. You have to. 
Efficiency, Vermont regulations, little, et cetera. Little, little bit of research into that, and, and this criterion is changing next year to more appropriately match the efficiency Vermont standards. Um, it's, it's close. I, I would be inclined to use some administrative discretion and say if you're filing an RBS, you're probably really close to old, 10 years old, and plus Energy Star. But, but this says, I'm reading 11.9.1 .1 here, and it says it must comply with, the, the, with RBs. The, the Everybody residential has building energy RBES, standard. RBES, there's efficiency Vermont, and then there's the stretch code five star. I understand, but what is it that that gets you points? Five star. Five, five star. star. So RBS is the, the base minimum that everyone has to do, and then there's efficiency Vermont, and then there's like the stretch code requirements, which overlap with the lead, uh, or not the lead. With so the to get the department. points, you need to meet the stretch code? Pretty similar, yeah. But the filing your RBES doesn't get you points in this category. Everybody has to file their RBES. It's a couple levels up from that. Okay. But you you understand that if you we're talking three houses that you're three three houses that we're building here as part oh, of this. We're not building them. We that just are that are you're looking for allocation to. To build, right? Whoever built them would build them at the at the it could be asked to build them at the higher. Right. So at eighty yeah. to ninety nine percent, which would mean all three, would need to be built to the standards, the energy efficiency standards, which by the way have a lot of long term benefits to somebody who's no, building a house. Would get you an additional eight points. So you know, you see what I'm saying, it's, and this is what the, what Pete was talking about is that there are ways here to get additional points. You, you just mandate that these guys that are going to do it have to, you got to go that route. Right. I didn't know if we were, uh, um, if we could do that. Do you know what I mean? I knew nobody came to me and said you have to do this this way. You know, you're nobody the one, came. You're to the one doing the permitting. You can you can do that. It's your land. You can assign. You can assign the. Um, that requirement. Yeah, I guess that's part of my confusion. It's like, you know, I'm from rural Vermont, you know, you want to sell a parcel of land, you sell a parcel of land, and then you're done, you know. So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> this is just bizarre to me. Okay. So, so the way this would work is if you were to sell a lot, and it was a permitted lot, mm -hmm. you would be selling the conditions that are associated with the permit to the buyer so they would be assuming those those conditions and if you were to agree to build to um, adhere to the five star um, energy then that would be uh, anybody who would buy that lot would have to adhere to that when they built it that's the way that would work yeah they, when they came and asked me to inspect it I would say can you show me your documentation that you've met what was committed to at growth management. So it's, it's really you as the applicant committing to it as a scoring criteria in growth management, but me and my office as the administrators of zoning checking up and making sure that a builder follows that. Um, so and most people do that anyway. What We're, do you contemplate we for this? What do you contemplate? And like, what, I don't know what the houses look like in the area. Oh, I have, is it, uh, well, we have a log home. We have a log home, and I don't know how to describe the other houses on that road. Um, but, I mean, we don't have a plan in terms of what these houses are going to look like. We were just going to, we just wanted to sell lot. land. That's all we wanted to do. You know, and then, you know, the people that bought the land would build their own house. I, I wasn't going to design it for them or, you know. You don't even have to do that. No. If, it, if it's committed to it, growth management, right. it becomes a condition of approval that exactly. I, as zoning administrator, enforce. Okay. I, I get to be the bad guy. She can tell you that they're going to build to the top of the line, and you can say that, oh, then that means that she gets 10 points? Yes. Well, that's what that would be the staff. The staff recommendation on this one is quite clear. It's the percentage of the units that will be built either to five star or lead, and that's it. Um, there's there's very little interpretation, if any, to be made in this category. Right. But it's so. also important that you understand that if you're committing to that, then there may be a 
a market impact for you, right? Somebody may buy it that wants to put, they can't put, they can't put a, a double, log. They can't put a double wide they on it. They may want to buy it. Yeah. With just aluminum. No, side I don't you know, think people like, would want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> not out there. You have never been out in Colorado, have you? Yeah. I have. There's a lot of double wide. Hey, hey, hey. So, so you should take pause before you make any commitment to that, because I want to make sure that you understand if you're considering that, what you are committing to. And if you're at all confused on that, we'll go over it again. I, I don't think that I'm confused. On, I mean, I, I agree with, you know, building an energy efficient home. I didn't know <laughs> that I had the right to say to somebody, when I'm going to sell them the land, it's your land now. Who am I to say that you have to build a certain type of house? Do you know what I mean? I mean, Did you listen to the last hearing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm picking on I know. you. Well, you know, and I, yeah, I did actually listen to the last hearing. But, you know, I that was mean, the whole discussion. Nobody, when we bought the land to build our house, nobody came to us and said, you have to build this type of house and you have to build it this way. And I just. Sure. So that's where my confusion, I think, lies. It's, it's really as simple as it's a permitted lot. There are conditions that come with the permit, and uh, to the buyer, please understand what those conditions are. And if you were to agree tonight um, that it would be a five-star five energy rating, that would be a condition um, for somebody who bought that land and wanted to build a house. If you don't want to um, agree to that, then then um, the, the score would, we'll have to evaluate it, but I mean, I think it was gonna, it's gonna remain a zero for that category. Do you, do you have any questions or concerns about any of the other proposed scores? No, I didn't actually get, I don't have the score, so I have to. Um, how would I know like what our house, we built our own house, we're still building it. Um, and uh, wrapping it up here. But um, how do I even know that ours is five star? I mean, what, what, what is five star? You have to have a certain type of furnace or our but factor at this point, for at your this point, you That's a question, that's a question not really relevant to this process. No, I understand that, but I mean, I feel a little, okay, you know, so here I am. So you, don't, you, you don't, you can, if you want to build your house as five star, that's up to you at this point. You're not required to no, do I that. No, I understand that. Okay. I guess I, you know, I, I've got this home and maybe it's only, let's say three stars, you know? <laughs> okay. But I'm going to make with the people that are buying the property next to me have to do a five star home. So I don't know what ours is. So and I don't, the what best is that? thing I think you could probably do yeah, is, is ask either you're the builder. Yeah, is get we, on, we get, had get somebody on the build the four the walls, reason. put the roof on, do the windows and the doors. The rest is us. We've been doing this for two years. Well, when, you, when you bought your windows, did the window guy say, here's the best windows we can sell you? Well, the they have a certain R value. Well, but I don't know if that's five stars. So, so right? generally, when we look at energy standards, um, what there will be is a list of criteria for the R value of the insulation, floor, walls, roof. That's the um, RBES form that I'm struggling with. Now. The RBES contains very similar criteria. So it's it, each, each of those levels of energy efficiency is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, in our, in our latest and greatest, we talk about things like the high performance standard coming from Efficiency Vermont, and, and there's even a blower door test that is done at the end to determine the efficiency of your air sealing. So all of, all of these different levels of certification have slightly different but somewhat similar requirements. Uh, some of them require a furnace of a certain efficiency. And, you know, what we see when people are trying to meet a standard of energy efficiency is it's like a checklist. And when you're, when you're at the beginning figuring out, you know, what you're going to build for a brand new house, um, those trade-offs and decisions aren't nearly as hard to make as someone who's, you know, doing a retrofit. So um, I'm picturing, let's say that this project was committed to five star and somebody came to get a permit for my office and they said to one of my staff, what's this mean? We would pull that list up and we would say, well, what does five star mean? It means 
you know, this R value in the roof. It means this uh, level of appliance efficiency for a furnace. It means your windows need to be at least so good. It may mean there needs to be um, a blower door test with a certain rating at the end. We would just, we would look, we would literally Google it and pull it up and say, you should be prepared as the builder of this house to be able to show the staff prior to us issuing a certificate of compliance that you've met all the things on this checklist. Even if it's just the builder literally signing saying, yep, yep, I did that. And, and that's, that's the way zoning enforcement works. So I'm not an expert in energy efficiency. I'm not gonna be able to go crawl in your attic and tell you what the R value of your insulation is necessarily. Um, we're relying on the person who builds the house to make reasonable representations, honest representations to us that they've followed those criteria. And as much as anything, it would be about us informing them at the outset. And we, you know, that's just, that's part of any number of permits that we issue. Um, so the commitments made tonight become part of the conditions of approval of the discretionary permit. They become part of the final plan set. They become part of that package of here's what was approved in this project that we would hand off to any prospective builder, buyer, realtor. You know, what's my buyer in for if they buy this lot in the Brown L. Lamar subdivision? Well, they need to meet these setbacks. Here's the lot. Here's the building envelope. Here's the efficiency standard that was committed to. And then people make an informed decision. Um, but I guess what I would say from my experience is, um, this is this is not like having an affordable housing covenant on a project where someone's limited to you know how much they can sell the house for. This is what you got to build. Yeah. Uh, at the risk of confusing this more, there are four four door, four allegation units here. Is that right? Correct. One the inherent that was with this property to begin with, mm -hmm. plus the two new houses, yep. plus the future development parcel, yes, which has already been openly discussed as being multiple potential lots in the future. Could be. Could be. The, the inherent one is the one I assume which is under construction right now. Mm -hmm. That, if they were to say 100% here, to get the 10 points for conservation of energy, would all of those would have to comply with that? I would say that the three units that are being requested now would have to comply so with it. Not necessarily the one that's currently under construction. Right, because- so that's, I think that's good news for this, yeah. our, our applicant. Yes. We, we, don't, we don't reach back to well, that inherent. The, okay, uh, the, the second piece though is that this would be committing that future parcel to this these points, which means regardless of how many lots you divided that into, that point kind of like the little it ball of mercury <laughs> that's on the table, right? <laughs> I would I would say yes. So 100% of the units requested are going to meet five star. If you come back and say, well, that one I'd I'd like to take that lot and have it be four they should all be committing to that same standard at that time to, to honor the original score. And if you yep. went for the 50% now, then, or 60 or whatever it is, you know, that would, it would all have to kind of be looked at in, in total there. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to make sure we all understand, including the applicant, that there's, it's important to understand what you're committing to. Well, the upcheck is the fact that homes are being built better today than they were 20 years ago in terms of energy efficiency. Right, I mean, it, this does open up some questions about the original issue because- This is this is the last year you're gonna see five star mentioned as a scoring criteria. Right. But, and again, and that actually highlights my point because in five years, the, the what, what we're, we're holding them to now may not exist as an energy efficiency standard. That's correct. I mean, that's, you know, in, in the new criteria, we're targeting uh, efficiency for high performance standard. That could change next year, and we're so left with lots of room for interpretation going forward with this. So yeah. Are you saying that, you know, so five star now, we agreed to the five star now. And in 15 years or 20 years, when my kids are ever able to afford to buy anything, build anything in Chittenden County, what if it's even higher than that, where they're only going to be held to the five star? The only standard the, that this system can hold you to is the one that was committed to at this hearing. Yeah. yeah. 
Hopefully that'll still be available to find. Hopefully, somewhere. And, and somebody may have to <laughs> go into the Wayback Machine and, and <laughs> resurrect a code that nobody's yeah. had to follow in 20 years and say, well, geez, if, is it, is it going to meet this? And probably it will because, as you said, the standards get higher. Standards higher. Are cheaper and easier to do. They don't tend to go the other way. Right. So mm -hmm. um, that that's in our favor of enforcing this stuff. Or have any more questions? I do. So. Um, the design for context, can you give me a little more detail on why that's five points as opposed to <coughs> a full ten? Uh, again, yeah. That, I think that go it, back to that? It's the X. It's yeah. the X. It's the X. Right, so we, we don't want to give it the very highest score, which would, which in my view, doing that would unreasonably box in the future development to, to something that might be very difficult to administer in the future. Okay. Rather, a middle of the road score that assumes there's going to be houses on that lot or those lots like other houses in the neighborhood, um, but but let's not uh, give it ten points and then and then have to try to figure that out a few years from now. Just just what that 100% compliance with that rather. Um, flexible scoring criterion is. I have a question. Will you be building the trail easement or how, what will you be doing as part of? We are working with the conservation commission. So, so to determine alignment. Yeah, so um, there They've agreed to dedicate an easement for a trail, um, for a primitive path, and, but that easement will encompass some of their existing built trails. But we're not going to require them to build out all of that, all of the trails. Even though, so it says under that criteria, it says with the developer building all on-site segments, that's not... Typically, um, we've given points for uh, uh, landowners who are willing to dedicate an easement. Um, we've given partial points in that category, not full points. I would say that in, in the matter of primitive trails, um, the dedication of the easement is most of what needs to happen. Yeah. After that, we send an intern out with a GPS and some signs. And as they say, we make the trail by walking. Yeah. Hard part is the hard part is getting it. So compared to a bike path or a sidewalk section that really yeah. truly has to be constructed, and there's a town specification, and there's all those kinds of things, um, you know, I suppose if somebody was offering us a primitive trail that involved significant construction work so as to be usable, like a big bridge, something like that. Um, in my case here, I think the board would want to have a a more informed conversation with the applicant about, well, is this really going to be a trail we can use or not? Um, but in, in this case, we have an offer to make publicly available some segments of trail that are already out there um, and then otherwise connect them with easements that the town would have a right to go in and identify, put on our maps, add signage to, um, things like that. Do we have any questions from the audience? Ma'am. Yeah. Uh, Chova Samson from uh, 120 Rose. So the question is for Matt. Can you clarify? So since this meeting is about uh, project scoring, right, usually the minimum is 30, so I still don't understand why this project scored 23, but the staff recommend uh, the board member to still have crew. What's the reason I think we get that? So the bylaw establishes the ability for the DRB to uh, allocate up to four units every year to projects that do not meet the 30-point uh, minimum score. And because of the things that are incentivized in growth management, it's not always 100% possible for a project to make a 30-point score, or it may be very difficult for a project to make a 30-point minimum score. Um, growth management highly incentivizes the provision of perpetually affordable housing, but that, that really comes with some strings attached. Um, somebody who's doing that is taking on a significant financial burden. 
Um, the bylaw in uh, the ag rural part of town highly, highly incentivizes third party conservation easements and or the donation of land to the town. But the, ha the land has to be land the town's interested in having or the easement has to be an easement that someone like Vermont Land Trust is interested in having. And uh, we, the, the exemption is sort of a recognition that there are other parties besides the applicant and the town that have to be interested in some of these things for these points to be accessible to the applicant. So uh, broadly, the reason there's an exemption available is because not all projects, and especially small projects with a, with a small number of units, generally have some difficulty getting to 30 points. Um, some of them have difficulty getting anywhere near 30 points. Um, so this is a project, um, you know, with, with, the, with a commitment to the energy efficiency, it does get to 30 points, or it could get to 30 points. Um, there, there may be some other ways in which to do it. Um, as I said, you know, um, not proposing development on that remainder lot five could change the score as well. Uh, but all of that has to be taken in balance with that, as it is, the town is asking that three quarters of the property be set aside as open space. Um, that's, a, that's a baseline requirement. As far as I know, that remains the most stringent open space requirement for subdivisions that exists in the entire state of Vermont. No other community asks for so much um, as Williston does. And so when you're saying to somebody, we want you to set aside 75% of your land and then we want you to try to get to 30 points and here's all these things we incentivize, um, a reality the town experiences is that not everybody makes it. Um, not everybody makes it all the way to 30. And then it's up to the board to decide whether they want to use their discretion or not or whether they think um, there's something the applicant could or, or should be committing to that would elevate the score above the minimum. Does that help? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You don't have to give me any reason, just yes. So there's no no standardized like there's no standard pretty much. Is that am I understanding correctly? Well, there is a standard. Okay, so what I, I want there to is a, there is, is a standard, and the standards are laid out what and what we are talking about um, with the with the scoring. But what Matt has said is that the board has has the option of um, assigning up to four units, four development units, four allocation units to any project, total of four, um, at any given year. We have, we have our own discretionary um, uh, use of them, okay? So forget the standards. We can assign four units to anything. That's, that's given to the board. Yeah. That, so that's, that's it. Um, but the, yes, there are standards. We can't assign five, six, seven, eight, nine. But we do have, we, we are given the right, uh, or the board, the DRB, is given the right to assign four to, uh, to a project that we, we, the board, through deliberation, determines is worthy mm -hmm. or not. It could be two projects. Absolutely. It could be, or three, or four. Yeah. One unit per. Yeah. Or, yeah. or none at all. So, just so, to be clear, if this applicant were proposing five development units she didn't meet the minimum score for of 30 and we only have four to allocate that's as much as you could do that's as much as we could do but we could still allocate her the four yes, yes. so partial allocation is allowed um, and that's true whether someone meets the minimum or not um, the ERB can attempt to make an equitable distribution of units when there's more being requested than are available um, I'll just read very briefly the exemption and it simply says the DRB may after having evaluated and ranked all proposed residential subdivisions as provided in this chapter allocate as many as four dwelling units each fiscal year to proposed minor residential subdivisions regardless of their score on the evaluation standards established in WDB 11.6, 11.7 or 11.8. So it just says may allocate regardless of score. Um, what is the a, definition of minor subdivision? Um, minor doesn't really have a lot of meaning in our bylaw anymore. Uh, there was a time when there were major and minor subdivisions and I, and I think the threshold was um, somewhere between five and ten units depending on the 
on the um, thing, but it's, it was not related to the size of the parent parcel or where it was or anything like that. Um, there's, there's no definition in Chapter 46 of this bylaw of a minor subdivision anymore. So, you know, what, what we have tried to do as staff is give the DRB as much evidence about every project as we can in their consideration of whether or not to make that allocation. But, you know, a year ago or about a year ago, um, these applicants were calling uh, the staff saying, the DRB didn't give us any of the four exemption units. Why? And the answer was because they didn't have to. They gave them to somebody else. Why did they give them to somebody else? Because they decided to. Um, there's, a, there's a small amount of essentially flexibility afforded the board regardless of score. Um, recognizing that not all projects have the same opportunity to score the same because of their context, the land that they're coming out of, um, et cetera. Right. It also avoids takings. So if this were a system that literally rendered some parcels of land in town undevelopable, the town would be in a position of needing to compensate those landowners for having taken all of their valuable property rights. That's the other answer. Name and address. So I just want to just make sure there's a clarification here. And there's three pieces to what I'm about to say, so I'll just preface this. So really, there's a loophole for the Development Review Board to, at their discretion, take into consideration at the suggestion of the staff to, we don't have the 30, but we're not looking for seven like a year or two ago. We're just looking for four. So therefore, it goes into what the law is, our bylaws, of what you're allowed to say yay or nay to. Does that make sense to you? Whether we like it or not, it's irrelevant. Okay? You have that right. You have that discretion. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we were here last fall. Why we were here the fall before. It's why last March this wasn't here. It's here now because we're at the four or less <coughs> at your discretion. Did I pretty much summarize that correctly? I, I would categorize it as a provision instead of a loophole. Bureaucratically, sure. Understood. Well, we could, we could change the statement completely if my question to Joe. you Joe. is, are you willing to commit to the five star for the properties that you want to yes. sell? Sure. Now the question I have then in the staff is, if she's going to do that, does that give her the 10 points that goes on this form? Yes we, or no? If, if, the, if that were a commitment that were made, we would be recommending you score the project accordingly. So, so yes. in other words, the project would change from 23 to 33, correct? correct. Assuming I'm reading the criteria correctly, yes. Mm -hmm. so in other words, then, 100% of all units certified, 10 points, sure. So in other words, nothing out of her hold pocket. On, hold on, you'll get So in other words, the question is, nothing out of her pocket tonight other than to say, yeah, when the builders actually do something, they got to meet your criteria. It's, it's a commitment that would be enforced through the permitting process right. and would be imposed on whomever owned those properties right. going into the future. And future development. And yes. future development. And on future development, yes. And like I said, and that would then eliminate your comment of the provision. Okay, so I believe he had two more comments. So let's let him. He just said my second one, which is perfect, <laughs> absolutely perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay. Because my second thing was, is that why not just commit to the five-star for the properties that you want to sell? Let me just answer. Let me just answer that, and you'll get a chance to keep on going. Absolutely. And, and the board, uh, speaking for the board, I think that I can safely say that the board would prefer to see that. Okay. Um, uh, I think we would prefer to see um, the project score as high as possible, um, and we'll leave it at that. And you have the provision to say we prefer it, but there's an exception. 
Okay? And, and, and I'm not against that. I'm asking that yes, that you do consider that because, I mean, my goodness, we just sat for an hour and a half here and about siding and this and that and you thought I would go off. <laughs> I was waiting. I'm not going to, which is really hopefully going to be a surprise to you. I just have those three points and, and this gentleman right here got the second one and uh, Matt's over there ducking. Um, <laughs> so I I'm ready to buy land in Williston and develop because I want to stand in front of you all or sit in front of you all and, and develop it. So um, that's where you I have, get you have, you have a third point. My third point was simply this, is that um, in the past meetings, and I, I can't make the third point, but I won't dredge up all the past meetings. Um, if you look in the notes and you look at the requests, I mean, for crying out loud, somebody just did a traffic study in the last review. I have asked that a traffic study be done. I have begged that a traffic study be done. The town of Williston will not pick up and drop off our kids at our road because they deem it too dangerous, okay? So if something is simple, I'm ready to say, you know, she doesn't have the 30 points, but hey, you know, as long as there's some things in there. And then the town of Williston, the fire department mentioned, you notice I'm not saying anything about class two or three wetlands. The town of Williston Fire Department, the police department deferred to the fire department. The road needs to be wide enough to get our fire apparatus up to EMS. You cannot, you can't get two cars past each other, let alone emergency vehicles. And if you're going to allow more houses on the road, then I'm asking you, per the recommendation, I don't, I, I, this wasn't my recommendation. So, so if anything, I so, like my nice little narrow street, and it's nice and private. But so it, Craig, in, in, Matt, can you read the standard? I can. I can. Or you can recite it off recite the top it of your from head. Memory. Thank you. Um, a residential driveway serving five or fewer units has to be 12 feet wide, four feet clear on either side, uh, with a with an adequate sub base, which is specified in our bylaw. I assume to prevent it from falling apart. Um, but it's 12 feet wide, four feet clear either side. Fire department often comments as to uh, what they feel they need for space to turn around at the end of a driveway like that. Um, those comments are often made at pre-application. They're often reiterated during discretionary permit. And the DRB's practice is frequently, if not all the time, to adopt the fire department recommendations as conditions of approval for final plan. So, I, you know, I, I mean, I will tell you that in, on the administrative side on a shared driveway in the last few months, um, I had to go back to the fire chief and ask about the location of a shed that a homeowner wanted to place and ensure that it wasn't impinging upon the turnaround for their apparatus because that condition was imposed as part of subdivision approval. That's how it works. Um, that's how it would work in terms of the review and any conditions imposed on this project or, or any other one in town. So, and I just thought of another thing and that was mentioned at the beginning. Um, that answers that question. Is this two units? Or is this, I heard single family to mirror the other homes on the road, because there's only single family dwellings there. It's two so duplexes. is this going to be? It's two duplexes. Two duplexes? Two duplexes? Two duplexes? I, no. Right. No. Two no. Two single families. No. Two single families. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. So just two single families, and then on that. Can I ask that question up front? You said it. I didn't correct you. I apologize. <laughs> Same here. I heard duplex. We, we ran right over it, Scott. Yeah, it's two you single said, families. You said five. That's why I asked that question. For the width of the road. Now, do, no. we, not, do we not count the people in South uh, Burlington on this road count? Because right now, it looks like there's four. Uh, those, those people are in Shelburne. Oh, or Shelburne or whatever. So absolutely is. not in that case. No, um, <laughs> no, we are we are in communication and have been as it relates to this project with the planner in Shelburne about any recommendations they want to make as well. Well, the reason I asked the question is because you said five. Well, there's there's looks like there's already four existing guys there. And we're adding two more, so that's no longer five. That's six, right? Not all in Williston. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. So in other words, we don't count. The, the Shelburne or South Burlington or whoever people that happen to tie it tie into this thing. We we will coordinate with Shelburne and we will seek whatever answer satisfies the DRB in their review of the project at the time of subdivision design. So you know, for example, if you or the board asks me to ask our land use attorney how we ought to look at that, um, if you want me to consult with the public works director, the fire chief. 
how should our bylaw be applied when some of what's happening is in a town that's not subject to our bylaw? Well, I think I asked this way back when we'll do that. first started. Yep. Okay, so that that's the question I have is so that if we're talking five or less, it only has to be 12 feet, but if the people that sort of are in the other town suddenly say that they want to be part of this uh, venture, then that means that we're not talking five anymore, we're talking yeah. six. I mean, I will say we've had, we've had some scenarios in recent memory, um, a house in Williston that's it's the service both sixth the or seventh house on a driveway that comes in from St. George. But I think that um, isn't at least one of these access, is it? Um, access, not directly. access directly from 116. It, I can answer that if I may. There's, there's not four existing. There's three existing. One is in Shelburne, so they don't see Shelburne. There's only two existing on the road in Wilson. I know what I'm doing here by saying this in the video. Mm -hmm. There's only two <laughs> in Wilson. I, listen, I, I, I'm just here. Oh, no, no. I'm not worried about that. I'm talking about the people that actually have access to this uh, road. To this road, there's one in Shelburne. That's right below us. Then there's us. And then there's the hard residents on the left. And then the two proposed out back. So technically, Williston will only notice or see four as on a private road so you're up to five so you got your shelving one all i ask is that especially with the traffic coming and going and that hill right there is ferocious coming yeah. up around that escrow you know what i'm talking yeah, about and for people there. the buses won't pick up and drop off so all i'm asking if and when you do say yes to this you know get the extra 10 points put the five star in and five star now means the best so in 20 years it doesn't matter if we have five star or not it should be the best, the highest, number one. Number two is just make sure that what our own town has asked for is that 12 wide, four on either side cleared, because there's, there's a lot of ledge and trees up there. So some changes are gonna have to be made. So just put those stipulations in there so that it is done. Does, does that surprise you that, that I'm asking that? That stipulation would be in there anyways, as a road standard. As long as it's definitely followed to the letter of the law. That's uh, nothing sneaky. Right. Nothing sneaky. Uh, and if they want to turn around uh, at the uh, end, understood. there's going to be some clearing required. Assuming that the board uh, that the board goes, you know, goes with the fire department's <laughs> yeah, recommendation. Right. You heard Matt say it. Nor, you know, 99% of the time we the board does, but not always. Okay. Um, that's that. Put yourselves on our road. Okay. That's, that's, that's all I'm asking. Any other points? What's that? Any other points? No, I just had those three and I packed down that extra one, so thank you for the time. <laughs> other questions from the audience? Ma'am. One more. So let's say it's on one twenty roads. So question for staff is so for instance, this if I it sounds like this is gonna approve tonight. So what if they got approved, right? Then they divide a different lot. Either them or whoever come into the bill in the future is that individual law when they apply a permit is there any cases or like just sounds like you will go through to anyone ever encounter the problem along the way they end up cannot build on the law um the only the only thing that i would say about that would be not that somebody couldn't build on the lot, but there will be conditions imposed on further development on the lot that any, any builder would have to meet. So for example, if somebody said, well, if they came to me and said, I wanna build on that lot, but I don't wanna do that energy efficiency stuff, I would say, well, then I can't give you a permit to build on that lot. Um, I, I would say that once a buildable lot is created under the standards of the day that say it's buildable, if the rules all change tomorrow and suddenly that lot was uh, smaller than we would allow or otherwise not conforming. There are provisions in our bylaw that say you can still build on a non-conforming lot. It's what most people would refer to as grandfathering. So um, when once you create that buildable lot and it's got allocation, um, anybody who can meet the conditions of subdivision approval um, and the provisions of the bylaw as, as far as they can, um, we'll be able to build on that lot. So I'm, I'm trying to imagine for you a scenario where the lot becomes completely unbuildable, but our bylaw itself 
has some provisions to prevent that because we really don't want to uh, change the rules and render something unbuildable because again then we then we've essentially taken it we we would have to buy it so you're saying like and likely it's very unlikely that something the town would do would render a created lot completely unbuildable and if it did that owner would be entitled to compensation um, you know, if we decided tomorrow that the setback to Route 116 was 2,000 feet and this whole lot was in that setback and therefore no longer buildable, we would have taken the ability for somebody to get a return off of that lot. And constitutionally, uh, we, we would be required to compensate for that. So we avoid that by saying, if we change the rules and it means that your property would not be buildable, your property is still going to be buildable, and we have a whole chapter in our bylaw that addresses that situation. Um, other, otherwise, we would be in in trouble. Other questions from the audience, sir? Now you were talking about easements for the trails. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the public? Can they use those yes. trails? So, where would the parking be if people decide? To come up from the public so we don't always create parking for trails um, we create parking when the town has the ability the number one the land the permitting ability to do so uh, the capacity to manage it but um, we've had trail easements in the past that we had for a very long time um, before actually going and creating parking because that tends to be a design challenge so for example sucker brook hollow off of route 2a we had those trail alignments we had easements we had we had land we had rights over in that area for a very long time before the town had the ability to do anything related to uh parking and in that case some some bridge construction that was required to make those work so it might be as simple as identifying those trails on a map identifying them with signs uh in the field but not identifying parking in that case, um, there is parking allowed along the side of any public road that's not otherwise posted as long as you're off the traveled right of way. The hard um, part, the hard part here that. is, is believe it or not, is not. I, I don't. I, for my my opinion, the hard part is actually not the parking. It's stringing together the easements. So it. So the the only time that the town ever gets a chance to gain an easement across a property is when it comes up in front of um, the town for a development request. Um, this this could go for decades before anybody actually um, started through hiking on it. Maybe that's not the right term, but or connecting or connecting. Properties yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's so what the town tries to do is piece together the puzzle, and I believe we've got a chart around somewhere. It's a town plan map. Town plan map has a list. If you ever wanted to stop in, take a look at it. You can see where all of the little easements that the town has on all the different parcels start to fit together and they don't all fit together there's one here and one here and one here and one here but as but as the as the development requests come in they, they add to it very slowly mm -hmm. and really that's that's what that's what's trying to be achieved here so eventually the puzzles are going to be put together eventually mm -hmm. eventually and and that's not entirely true in that the town can affirmatively go out and buy pieces and, and yep. acquire yep. Yep. those rights sure. from others so let's say they got 85 percent of connectivity on something they might then allocate some funds yep. in order right. to get to acquire the other 15 percent so it's not just when that's correct, that's correct. When, yep when development occurs but it could be uh, at the initiation of the town yep. so that makes me think of something else that so points are allotted for giving easements, which is public use. Now people have the right, the public has the right to park on the public road. Rosewood is not, it is a private road, so therefore they could not park on Rosewood. However, South Brunel? Yep. Public? Public road. Mm -hmm. So points were given, could we give a few more points to get it more guaranteed up past the 30 if it were said it could come through my property? No. Not mine. <laughs> but the property that's being trying to develop would there you know wouldn't you take that into great consideration to say hey wow you know you're given this you're given this public easement and you can park along our road off of South Brunel because there's only one spot where 
you can really park there and the cops already take it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, wouldn't that be, I, I'm trying to be nice here. Yeah, the, the scoring criteria is pretty specific to trails. Um, I, you know, I would say, yeah. you know, there's, there's some flexibility for the board. If somebody had a really great facility, they were going to be able to offer up, um, you know, I encourage the board to, th to think about that when they consider their point awards. But really, this is just about getting, getting those bits and pieces, um, together so that we can start to connect them. And I will say, you know, from the town's perspective, um, what I was saying about, you know, we don't necessarily develop parking. We don't necessarily develop uh, trailhead facilities that encourage the highest intensity of use of every piece of the trail system. Cause sometimes that part of the trail system is just not ready for that. Um, you know, so there, there are times when we're ready to develop a parking area and a trailhead and, and signs that really, you know, encourage people. And, you know, if it's a long segment of trail that connects somewhere that starts to make sense. But sometimes, you know, as Scott alluded to on our map, there's just a piece of trail, uh, trail easement we own that we don't even go out to develop because it just doesn't go anywhere yet. And in fact, it might dead end into a piece of private property that we don't want to encourage people to uh, end up on, for lack of a better term. We, we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, being respectful of all of those property owners whose property we're, we're crossing and, and being near. So could, could the board give more points for a, a more enhanced facility? Sure. But I would also say that at the growth management hearing, it's not the best place in the world to start trying to design those facilities, but rather rather right, go with I'm what appears feasible. I'm just saying, you know, there's really no parking on, on a private road. And right. so if, if this easement, which is going to be offered to, for public walking, um, South Brunel is really the only road in that. <coughs> road. Those drop-offs on the side are pretty, hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to encourage the safety. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Any questions from the board? I guess I'm still just not 100% clear on whether or not you are going to commit to the five star. Yes. Five star. Yeah. So yes, you are committing to the five star. Okay. And yes, that means the score is now 33. It could be. You'll be deliver. Uh, you'll okay. be deliberating on that. Okay. But. That, the, would that be the proposed? Yes. Okay. We would propose 10 points in that category if all three of those units are going to meet five star. Okay. 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 Anything else? No. no? <laughs> You're sure. I want to go home. Go to bed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for system. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, that was DP 19-03, Brown L. LaMarche. Next up is DP 19. It, it, before we do get, in, get into this, anybody want to take a break? Any, anybody? Everybody okay? I'm sure they do. Uh, next up is DP 19-05, Brissett Subdivision. Hello. Hi there. Hey, man, address please. Andrea Natolo, Trudeau Consulting Engineers, 478 Blair Park Road. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Michael and Jessica Brissett request um, to subdivide a 10.74 acre parcel into two residential lots and one open space lot at 495 Porterwood Drive in the Agricultural Rural Residential Zoning District. The parcel is currently developed with one single family unit. Requesting one additional unit to build the second home. Uh, in the category of conserve energy, the proposed score is zero. They're not proposing five star or LEED certification. They're not proposing affordable housing, um, so another score of zero. Um, they're not proposing to build any paths or trails or give any easements. In design for context, we gave the project the full 10 points. Uh, proposing an uh, additional single-family dwelling in a neighborhood of single-family dwellings on individual parcels. Conserve open space. Um, the application does have that 75% open space parcel, but they don't get points because they're not doing um, a third-party easement or dedication to the town. <coughs> and the last category, minimize visual impact. They received the full 20 points for invisible development. Uh, because um, this project is not visible from a public road. The nearest public road is Old Creamery Road, 
Porterwood Drive is private, um, maintained by the Wilson Fire District. Um, based off of that, uh, 10 plus 20, the project <coughs> receives the minimum score of 30 points. And therefore, staff recommends one unit of allocation in fiscal year 2019. <coughs> Thank you. Andrea, what would you like to add to that? That uh, all sounds good. Um, definitely agree with the 20 points and the 10 points. Um, this project doesn't have a lot of room to score more points. I think the only place that could potentially score points is the conserve energy category. Um, I do have some questions about if, um, since it seems as though this project will now be the lowest scoring project of the three um, if that affects the allocation in any way <coughs> um, I think the answer to that is maybe mm -hmm. however I also think the also the answer to that is we have more allocation units than we are actually handing out and have requests for Correct. Right. So you you have units available to allocate in fiscal 19, which is the year we're already in, um, and in fiscal 20, which is the year that starts on July 1st. Um, and in for everything that's already been allocated plus everything that's requested this year, there's room in both of those fiscal years to to allocate to the projects that have requested. So there's a two-part answer to your question. The first question, the first answer is. When I said maybe, it depends on if the board agrees with the staff's scoring of the project. Right. Yep. The second, the second answer is the one we just gave. We just gave is that we, there are allocable units available, exceeding the amount that have been requested today. <clears throat> so, so it's really the thirty points that is the importance here. It's not the thirty-two or a thirty-three or a thirty-four when compared to the thirty. It's about the allocation availability, and if which, which there's plenty for this one, and then does it fall below 30, then it becomes it would need a for us to use one of our discretionary units. I also just want to confirm that there is no future potential for development. Correct, correct with this lot. This is this is the maximum potential that it has yeah it's um, pretty cut down by both steep slopes and wetlands on the site I think the maximum units was 2.23 um, which would round down to two okay so two would be the maximum so yep. have to have a third allocation okay. questions from the board mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, no, I guess I would just like to stress that I don't believe um, that build affordable housing paths or trails um, or conserve open space are necessarily viable areas to receive points on this project. Um, the project could potentially receive points on conserve energy, um, but I would take into mind that it is within a mobile home park. Um, and they are looking to probably put another mobile home there, so the options for a five-star lead mobile home are quite limited as well. Um, but other than that, we'll, we'll keep the proposal as is. Okay, okay. And they get the five-star rating from the propane industry. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Next up is DP 19-09, Howard, Butternut Road. <laughs> I don't even, I've lost track. That's <laughs> Kevin, are you doing this just for fun or what? Are you sitting around, sticking around just for fun? Who am I? Yeah. Oh, you're with them? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, Thought you were there. He for watches the, for the, the early neighbor. Morning. He watches the train bears down the hill. That's he's just here on a, <laughs> on a zoological survey. Got it. Okay. 
Sir, if you would state your name and your address, please. Gary Howard, 697 Butternut Road. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Matt. Hi, I'm doing this one. So this is a proposed five-lot subdivision of 121 acres of land on Butternut Road, uh, east of 846 Butternut Road, west of 1120 Butternut Road. We're in the agricultural rural residential zoning district. Uh, there's an inherent right to build one dwelling unit that comes with the property, uh, and there is no dwelling on the property today. Uh, this is another one of the projects I alluded to in the beginning, where there are lots proposed for more imminent development. There is perpetually protected open space proposed, and there are two, uh, for lack of a better term, remainder lots proposed for potential future development. And as in the other case, staff is recommending one unit of allocation be awarded to each of those as part of this process and the project be considered and scored based on an assumption that those lots will eventually be developed. So for this project, in the criteria of conserving energy, um, the applicant has marked it as not proposed for any units, therefore no points are proposed to be awarded for energy efficiency. No affordable housing is proposed, so no points are proposed to be awarded for affordable housing. Um, the applicant is proposing uh, a trail easement and to provide that as part of the discretionary permit review process. Um, staff is recommending five points. Uh, so the score here is five to 10 points if a easement is provided depending on the length of the path or segment. So if you're providing any trail easement at all, the minimum score is, is five. So uh, five rec doesn't just rep five doesn't represent halfway, it represents the minimum score if you're providing a trail at all. And just wanna provide that context there. Um, we're, we're not exactly sure what the length of that segment will be yet. Um, in design for context, Applicants proposing single family dwellings on large, lot, um, large acre parcels similar to other density on Butternut Road. Out of uh, a maximum score of 10, staff recommended a score of eight. Um, and on conserve open space, there is 75% perpetually protected open space in compliance with the bylaw being proposed, but no third party protection or donation to the town. Therefore, no points are recommended in the open space category. In terms of minimize visual impact, um, staff is proposing that this project be scored as invisible development, 20 points. And I will note that that draft score is based on development happening on all of the lots that might someday be developed, including lots four and five. Uh, the board, if you were to want to inquire more deeply on this score, I think your inquiry would be well focused on lot four, which does have frontage on Butternut Road, but is a large lot um, with some potential to be developed in a, such a way that a um, house or other development might still be invisible from Butternut Road. Um, that is the assumption that's baked into that maximum score right now. So, uh, so it's something to think about. That there's a, there's a future condition that says lot for any future development on lot four must be completely screened from butternut correct so it must be situated on that lot and in, in so number one you couldn't put it um you know 50 feet off of butternut road and reasonably expect it to be invisible um it would it would have to be located near the rear of that lot so i'm i'm going That's a something that you you're fine with oh yeah oh yeah there's no way you i mean butternut road Brook, vertical 120 foot bank feels behind that. I mean, no. So yeah, if you if you look at the topo lines there. You can't see it. Um, there's, there's some things at play that staff believes makes it reasonable for the DRB to find that development on that lot could be, could be invisible. Uh, the DRB, at whatever point in the future where a discretionary permit was reviewed to develop that lot, may need to consider some conditions to ensure that. Um, as, as part of 
the upcoming development review, although we might not see a driveway or septic engineering on that lot, staff might recommend that the DRB have the applicant propose a building envelope on that lot that would inform that finding of invisibility. Um, and staff make, has notes to that effect for the future DP? We won't forget. I know you won't. <laughs> um, okay. but, but it's it's as I said, you know, there's there's some thinking for the board to do about what tasks it might be creating for itself in the future um, when distantly future development might come back for discretionary permit review. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. I've learned a lot tonight. One of the things I, <laughs> I have, I really have. It's not just been. One of the things I didn't realize was that I could control somebody else's building. I was selling lots. I, I had no idea that I had control over the energy efficiency of the houses that are being built. Um, would, you like to, would you like to add that in? Yes. I, I, I would very much. What? Sure, it's all the land, but I can also tell them how they can build the house. Oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll let them we would, feel. We would, we, while we would, not, we would not demand it for you, uh, of you, we would certainly encourage it of you. Yeah, I, and I can't see any reason. These are relative, they're intelligent people. They should understand the efficiency of building a house to a certain set of standards that make it. Efficient. Uh, Are you under contract? No, uh, just for the land. I am under for the land. Yes. The land. You've under, you, you're under contract to sell the land. Yes. Okay. So 100 percent of yeah. the houses. Yeah. Okay. I can't see. Yes. Yeah. I have another question as well. Yeah. These two lots that I'm trying to rec requisition or, or approve for my son and daughter. Um, is there a time frame on those? I heard way back in the very beginning this evening, I heard something mentioned about running out of time. Mm -hmm. And so, I, just, I just didn't have it straight in my head where they fit. So assuming each of those lots were assigned a unit of allocation, the, the normal window in which they could build would run for five years from the date of the fiscal year. Uh, on which they started. Should those lots not be permitted within that initial five-year window, one of those lots, I believe, per year could be built after that. So you build one one year, you build one the next. That's the slow build provision in Williston that now, prov that now replaces outright expiration of units. Okay. So I don't have to worry about them expiring only about when they're going to be built. It, it, it might alter the timing of when a permit could be issued for yes. one of those units, but you would not end up in the situation of owning a separate lot of land that was otherwise buildable, but for the expiration of okay. growth management. That's what the select board amended the rules That's the same situation I heard the lady two ladies ago saying, you know, I've got kids that who knows when they're going to be financially able to build there, and I didn't want to have it be termed. I didn't want to set them into something that would terminate the process because there are ways out yet. I'm, I'm the last staff person in Williston Planning who experienced the joys of expiration and, and reassignment of allocation over the last 10 years. Um, some of the DRB members who were here for that can attest to its complexity <laughs> and, and challenge. The, the slow build provision adopted by the select board serves, serves the town well and, and eliminates that. So, uh, is slot four going to need a bridge? Yeah. Question, could he end up building the bridge one year and then build the house the following year in a slow build? We've, yeah. we've, we've split permits before um, to, to handle infrastructure needs. Um, yeah. in, in terms of growth management, what matters is when you permit the house. Yeah, so what I'm, try, what I'm trying to say is they could be, like, for example, they could be building lot five and building the bridge on lot four in the same year and then building lot four's yep. house the following year, right? Yeah, we do, we do infrastructure permits. We do all sorts of things that sort of separate out the development activities. It sounds like lot four needs a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. You yeah. Don't like it, him, do you? 
Well, no, it's not, it's not that. It's not that. It's not that. No. <laughs> It's just that that's the, if you look at the map, that's just the way it lays out. I mean, I don't, I didn't have much choice. I prefer not trying to feel, find my way up that 130 foot bank. But I would prefer that a lot, but that's not going to be my. Matt, could you a, a little clarification on the slow build then? That are you saying that after the five years they have to build a house each no. year? No. No, but if, if you go out of that schedule, you are placed on a slower schedule. Which means you, you can't build it as quickly. Right. right. And, and in fact, that's the way the system used to work about until about 20 years ago. And once in a while, we would get a permit application for a very old subdivision in Williston, like Heinz Estates or Over Lake View. And Ken and I would look at it and go, well, what's the growth management dispensation? Didn't this expire? And we'd go back to that version of growth management. And lo and behold, there was a thing that said, you build this many units per year, and if you fall out of that schedule, you can only build three units a year for every year after that. Every and it, the administration of that was so easy, and the impact on the town was so minor that when we went back to the select board about what are we going to do with this expiration provision, we said, why don't we do it the way we used to do it? That actually worked pretty well. And that's where we're at. Other questions for the board? Did that with my elbow. Any questions from the audience? Sounds like you're all here for it. <laughs> uh, yes, hi, my name is Kevin Mazuz on 1120 Butternut Road. Uh, first and foremost, I, I, I'd like to thank the staff for their, their patience. Um, as, <laughs> as this process evolves and this, this development is quite fluid, we're learning more and more each time we come here. Um, so, uh, much appreciation to the staff for their uh, clarification around rules and the bylaws and such. Um, even in the staff notes, you know, I, I appreciate the comments around how things will change from pre-application to growth management to discretionary permitting. Uh, there's, there's a lot that we need to learn. Um, to the board, um, with the comments that I shared with you, a lot of them are just simply comments on the process that we're in now. My partner Jesse um, came before the uh, pre-application process and shared um, his concerns with, um, with Gary and with the board around the well that we have a right of way to as well as the driveway. And Gary very kindly um, provided us with uh, the wastewater and the well uh, plans to that so <clears throat> which I think just goes to show that there's there's an open conversation around this and there has been from the get-go and we appreciate that um, and, and then uh, finally you know in sharing my comments with you uh, in the written form prior to the meeting a lot of that was just to to be engaged in the process because um, this is going to drastically change that part of the Butternut Road by adding additional homes to it. My comment earlier, uh, or my question earlier about habitat, um, uh, pardon me, I've forgotten the term already, habitat assessment, um, you know, as we go forward with that, what that's going to do based on the discretionary permitting of all of the new parcels, because initially there were just two, plus the open space is a concern of mine. And I know that this is not the time to say it, but because there is a question um, in criterium around open space and the contiguous uh, open space to uh, adjacent parcels is a concern of mine, um, simply because of the uh, potential impact to not only um, my dwelling but the uh, the environment around it and the habitat around it there's a significant impact there if a wildlife corridor is not kept um, so again I just wanted to say thank you to the board to the staff and certainly mr. Howard for including us in the process oh Kevin <laughs> <laughs> I owe you an awful lot more than that <laughs> sir. Uh, anyway um, I, I yeah I was I was unneighborly to Kevin and he seems to have accepted my apologies, which is good. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Any other comments? From the board. So 
one summary question. Did you say that you are going to ask for five star stuff for points? Yes. Oh, okay. That's just want to confirm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And would the staff change their recommendation then on that? So, if one hundred percent of the units are proposed to meet five star lead, um, the recommended score would be ten. Okay. For that One more time. Anything else? Okay. Thank you for coming. When do we find out? Oh, it's tomorrow. Nine o'clock? Or three. I don't know. Who, who do you want to talk to here? I don't know. Call me at five of eight. But okay. You want the caffeine like, to set it. I'm like, I think just because the nervous does a little bit. So it is. Uh, 1057 and thereabouts, 1057, and the uh, Development Review Board for the Town of Williston on March 26th is out of deliberation on growth management. Um, do I have a, uh, do I have a motion for the uh, other sewer service area allocation? Yes, as authorized by Chapter 11 of the Wilson Development Bylaw, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Wilson Development Review Board, having reviewed all of the submitted growth management questionnaires and accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of March 26, 2019, make the following allocation of dwelling units within the growth target established by Chapter 5 of the Wilson Comprehensive Plan, within the town's other sewer service area, as shown in Table 4 above, established by the Development Review Board on March 26, 2019. We will be providing allocation in this area for uh, uh, the Adams read, subdivision, read the DP. Uh, DP 19-11, uh, which achieved a score of 31. They will be getting four units in FY 2020 and four units in FY 2021. Okay, that's the that's it for that's it for that's the it for that. that sewer service allocation. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Pete seconds. Any further discussion? No. No further discussion. All in favor. Aye. 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 Was it five? Jill, what did you aye? Aye. Five ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Do I have a motion for uh, WDB 11.9 outside sewer service area allocation? Yes. As authorized by Chapter 11 of the Williston Development Bylaw, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed all of the submitted growth management questionnaires and accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of March 26, 2019, make the following allocation of dwelling units within the growth target established by Chapter 5 of the Williston Comprehensive Plan outside of the town sewer service area, as shown in Table 4 above, established by the Development Review Board on March 26, 2019. We will be providing allocation for the following projects. Uh, DP 19-03, Brownell LaMarche, which scored 33 points. DP 19-05, Brissett Subdivision, which scored 30 points. And DP 19-09, Howard Subdivision, which scored 33 points. That allocation will be as follows, FY 2019, Brissett 1, Howard 3, FY 2020, uh, Brownell LaMarche 3, Howard 1. Okay, and those documents will be turned into staff as evidence of our scoring and um, uh, allocation of the units to the fiscal years. Uh, do I have a uh, second? 
I'll second. Pete seconds. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five ayes, no nays. Motion carries. All right, that's great. Um, do I have, I'm sorry? One question. Yep. question. Yep. Paul? Do we need to uh, add a comment to the fact that uh, the North Group has gone to 4-4 in fiscal year 22-20? No, because that's what they had originally. Okay. So we didn't make any changes, no changes to it. To that. that's all. Okay. That's all. Okay. Yep. Well, that's a good, good question. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 12, 2019? I'll make that motion. Jill makes the motion. Do I have a second? I second it. John seconds it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain. I wasn't present. Four ayes, one abstention. Motion carries. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting at 11.05? Absolutely. So moved. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That was good.